I'm back, motherfuckers. Been a hot, 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 hot minute since I put out an episode. That is because I was launching a new music project, S-L-A-E-V, Slave, the dark electronic duo, elegant, esoteric electronic. Check it out. Instagram, all that fucking whatever shit. Twitter, SoundCloud, Spotify, whatever. It's on all the regular places. Um, but I'm back with the podcast. And this episode, I have a good old friend, headphone activist. But I split it into two episodes because we went over four and a half hours. And you pussies have commitment issues. And you'll listen to two episodes split up two hours each. But if you see a singular episode for four hours, your boots start to tremble. Your panties get in a grundle. And you get scared. Four hours. That's too scary. Um, I'm the same way, so I really can't judge you. It's a weird part of human psychology. We won't watch a four-hour movie, but we'll binge watch a Netflix series, Stranger Things, for 12 hours straight on a Saturday. I don't get it. But whatever, it's the way we work. So I'm splitting it into two episodes. This episode is going to clock in right around, uh, I think, an hour 45. Um, we go over sh- all the shit. The Witcher, movies, video games, his music, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's one of my favorite people to talk to. Um, we always have great conversations, which is why we go over four hours every time we talk. So I'm going to split this one up into two. I'll have the part two come out next week or whenever I get the, the second part edited. Probably next, not next week because I'm really slow at editing. I do try to edit it very tight, meaning sometimes it's going to sound not natural. But for me, when I listen to a podcast, I hate when my time is wasted. I hate long pauses. I hate ums and does and just people talking over each other. So I try to edit it down where you get the most juicy content delivered in the most punchy way possible, which means my turnaround time a little slow, but I think it makes for a better experience. Uh, As far as actual gaming, I am playing through Beyond the Beyond right now. Uh, an old PS1 JRPG that I never beat as a kid, and I wanted to beat it and do some videos on it for the YouTube channel, which I am still working on and is somehow growing in subscribers, even though I haven't added a single goddamn new piece of content And who knows how long, but... Um, that's the cool thing about YouTube. You make really deep, cool gaming content and it's evergreen. Keeps pulling in traffic. So I'm going to be doing more, re- not really reviews because everybody can do reviews. Everyone in the dog can do reviews. Everyone does retrospectives. I'm going to do a video series on what I like and dislike about a game. Why I like something even though it's bad. Why I dislike something even though lots of people like it. Um, just my thoughts and then how I'm playing a lot of these games because I do a lot of emulation tips and tricks to make the experience better. And with Beyond the Beyond, it's absolutely necessary because that game is a goddamn it's just the grind. It is so slow. The loading times are just like, oh, Lord Almighty. The menus are like the old school JRPG where instead of having a contextual action button, you have to like open the menu. Then it gives you talk, search, whatever. You got to go through that. You, each member of the party can only hold so many items. You have to like move items amongst people. You don't have like a set item menu. Items don't double up. So if you have like 10 herbs, it's not herb X10. You have 10 of them. It's 10 separate herbs taking up item slots in your fucking in- inventory. It's like old school JRPG shit that is just so annoying. But luckily with emulation, you can fix a lot of that. Um, I bumped the speed straight up to 2x. The game is so slow. At 2x, it feels like a normal game. All the regular stuff, upscaling to 4K, texture upscales, etc., etc. Save states helps a lot because the game is brutally hard. The freaking encounter rate for enemies is... I forgot how brutal some of these old school JRPGs was. It's like every three steps, you're encountering an enemy. And the battle, like, loads slow. The battle system is slow. You can't get anywhere. The only reason the game, on average, takes people 40 hours to complete is because 30 of those hours is walking four steps and having to go into a battle. Um, With the speed boost, that really, really helps. I've been grinding every area to make sure I get a little over-leveled. That way, when I go through a dungeon, I can just mash attack, get through the dungeon, and then the boss fights... I put at lower speed and actually play them the way you're supposed to play them because I think that's where the fun is. Anyway, it's it's an okay game. I remember loving it as a kid because it was the first JRPG that I actually owned myself. But yeah, it's not really that big of a... It has a small cult following and it's a small cult following for a reason. I'm enjoying it, but the game objectively is just not... It's not that great, but I'm going to beat it because I never did as a kid. Other than that, I'm working on the YouTube videos. I'm working on TikTok videos and Instagram, trying to be consistent with those. I'm playing through Chaos Legion on PS2. A lot of people have been requesting that. And all around, just trying to get a little bit of game time to coincide with content every single day. 
and editing every single day and trying to be consistent because a lot of people have been messaging me and it feels really nice that, hey, what's going on? Why aren't you putting up a podcast? I enjoy your podcast. It makes me feel good. And like, you know, maybe I actually have something here worthwhile. I was honestly just going to shut the whole thing down and focus on music. But as the more I thought about it, I'm like, I, I, I love gaming. So I'm going to keep it up. So hopefully you guys enjoy it. Headphone advocate. I cannot speak. Head phone motherfucking activist i will put all the applicable links to his music and socials in the podcast description otherwise like share comment the good news of the gaming gospel ye shall be blessed i say these things in the name of me and the father kojima the son and carmack the holy ghost amen and enjoy the show I recently played Elden Ring. I don't know if you've played Elden Ring. Yeah, I've been watching it religiously online. Oh my God. I saw a video that perfectly expresses my sentiment with that game. Yes, the game is good as the hype, but don't get it unless you're ready to get it because it's like crack cocaine. Yeah, it's like Tarkov. I haven't had to like actively manage my relationship with the game in a long time because usually it's like I'm playing games for the podcast, making clips promoing it there's a purpose behind it elden ring just nothing mattered once i got elden ring and i set aside a week basically to play it because my brother took time off from work as well we knew this was coming and he took pto off and the week went by and it was normally i get burned out like most games it's like 12 to 18 hours if it gets me i start to fade out and want to either make content or do something else I hit 40 hours on that game and i i felt like i had played two and i knew i was in trouble yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like shit. I saw my Steam hours, and I'm like, I'm already at 40 hours, and and I'm like, okay, well, I took the whole week off anyway. It ended up being like a three and a half week binge. Sounds about right. It got to the end where it was like I wanted it to be over. I just wanted it to be over. It'd been too long. Like shit was falling apart. My kids were like asking why I don't play with them. It was just like <laughs> your life was becoming unmanageable. <laughs> it yeah. was just like I got this game. My wife is super cool. She knows how I am. And I and I had even warned her. And she knows me and my brother bond over these Souls games. And so it's like she knew what was coming, to, so to speak. But even she was like, dude, this is bad. Is it over? Are you done? When are you back to life? And she started giving me shit about like a week and a half in. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Anyway. Like, can we get back to our lives at yes. some point here? Like, we need to get back on schedule. But, like, in your defense, too, though, like, with the gaming drought that we've been going through, that you and I spoke about the last time we were on a call, um, this is the first game to me, for me in, like, maybe since PUBG that actually pulled a community in like that that was more than 12 hours of gameplay and then on to the next thing. Yeah. Like, the gaming community absolutely needed an experience like that to remind people why they love gaming so much. Like you look at Fortnite, for example, the most innovative thing that they did is they took out the building. So what, we're just back to battle Royales now. <laughs> like, I'm not trying to trash their company. Cause I know a lot of people are having fun right now, but it really feels like most development teams are just pushing the least amount of creativity that they've ever done in gaming because they know their audience will just eat it up because they have all these Twitch streamers there that they can just shell money to, to play their games. And it'll just bring a whole community with them as opposed to back in the day, you really had to make <laughs> something equivalent of an Elden Ring experience in order to get people to say, I'm going to put my $60 to this instead of that. I hadn't thought about that because I don't follow the, most of the shooters with the online, I'm not an online gamer. I yeah. think uh, I'm just too old for that. You're only, how old are you? 31. 31. I'm 36, almost 37. So yeah, a little bit of a gap. I don't know if I missed it. Well, I also, I had what, like five or six years on you with like the Modern Warfare uh, Xbox 360 audience. So like when I was of that prime age to learn gaming, I was learning through online shooters. So I have a little bit of an edge there, but I'm already getting phased out too. <laughs> There's been a few online games that I've gotten into and I've maybe done a similar thing like maybe i'll competitively play an online game for upwards to maybe 40 to 50 hours and then mm -hmm. I, I usually get sick of it uh besides smash over the years I've, I've played smash consistently with friends because of social events but uh i did a little bit of halo infinite and i got really into it for like a month 
played with some homies and then it, it faded off. I didn't realize that we were in a, a bit of a drought until you brought it up. I don't pay attention to like the Fortnite stuff, but I was thinking about a good single player experience previous to Elden Ring. The Witcher. Yeah, it's going to be The Witcher. Control by Remedy is another one. Um, if you haven't played Control, the world building and the lore and that is like top tier. The rest of the game, I would say S tier when it comes to world building and lore. Everything else is like A or B tier, depending on your personal tastes. Yeah, The Witcher 3, but The Witcher 3 also was pretty janky. Yeah. Like for in the beginning. Um just like Cyberpunk. Yeah, just like <laughs> Cyberpunk, which I played at launch. I didn't have a bad time with Cyberpunk. So, or did I? Did you play it? We, we yeah, this is this is uh we hey, it wasn't out when we talked, right? No, it was. It was, but it was right past we I think we talked and it had just gotten past the phase of like everybody played it. Guns were floating through the cut screens, like it was <laughs> in that stage of like the game. So we didn't talk too much about it without basically saying, uh, we'll wait and see how the updates go. And sure enough, just like the Witcher, they're cleaning up the game and it's becoming more playable. Yeah. Another game that's been really impressive with that is No Man's Sky. Yeah, dude. Talk about a comeback. They've been successful at regaining the trust of community. People love No Man's Sky. People love the developers. Like sometimes people say it's impossible to achieve forgiveness in like today's internet culture, but not necessarily because No Man's Sky has totally, in my opinion, from what I can garner, like everyone looks up to them now and the community loves them. These free updates keep coming and they're better and better and better. But do you remember the backlash they got on the initial rollout? No, I mean, it was worse than Cyberpunk's, in my opinion. Um, in regards to like the feedback people were giving them. But that's to me, if you like improve a game that has a good like core concept to it, like that's very forgivable. Like in internet culture, if you compare it to like the uh, art artisan builds, PC stuff, if you saw what happened with those guys getting canceled. Um, if not, I'll just leave it. <laughs> I don't, I'm not aware. The, so give me the basically PC giveaway stuff. Uh, guy criticizes one of the people who's supposed to be getting a PC. Then, literally, like every Twitch uh, streamer drops them because they're like, oh, wow, this company's actually full of like degenerate douchebags who are on like a clout power trip. Um, like that shit isn't forgivable. Having a game that needs some work, but you rushed it too quick because you're part of a major corporation that just wants the game out so they can get some of their money back on their development. Yeah. Like that's forgivable. So, that's that's I think you bring up a good point that that's one thing that's cool about the gaming space is when it comes to the development side, it's like, sure, titles not might, might not be as polished um, as we want them to be on launch like they used to be when you'd buy an N64 cartridge or something like that. And like that was pretty much the game yep. right there, unless uh, you're throwing some extra cheats into the game later on. But now games are rolling out. They might not be as polished, but they're getting way more community development put into them and i think that part's pretty cool is developers are actually listening to community feedback and beta tests are being taken more seriously and from a wider range of people who are testing them not just like an elite few in a warehouse i think the, the prime example is if there's probably a theoretical threshold of it needs to be polished to x amount at least and like it seems like the market is still navigating like what what level of, of polish are we going to be accepting at launch Mm -hmm. um it doesn't it still seems to be pretty good like i will say it was hard to be a pc player and have my ps5 owning a brother talk shit on me and to be totally correct because i was experiencing really bad frame rate problems with uh with the pc ring? version yes and i have my my pc rig is so fucking ridiculous and i have headroom for days i I eat everything alive for the most part. And I would turn the, the resolution down to like 720p and still have stuttering. It, you know, it's nothing I could do about it. That's the problem with open-ended operating systems though, versus like a standard, like this is what you get and this is the box. And like, that's all it's ever really going to be. It's like laptops versus uh, towers. Do you have a sense of like how much I've always wondered what the cost is. So let's say you and I are developing a, a game for this generation and Okay. And we have it ready to go and we start we go through the QA process and we want to we want to make sure it's ready to port to all these different systems. Like is it 10x more expensive cuz you you're probably going to hire some contractors or someone to help you to get it ready for PC? How much more expensive is it to get it ready to deal with the open-ended operating system 
compared to like if we were just developing it for like Sony, Xbox, or versus like what sells. Right? Obviously, there's also a big marketplace for PC games because some games seem to come out of the gate like consistently really good, even though they're they're launched on multiple consoles on for PC and they're awesome. And then I've so I've always wondered like what's going on there. Is it are people doing it in-house or are there agencies that specialize in that, that are industry standard? I've always wondered that because... That's a great question. I mean, my, my knowledge of all of that would be elementary at, at best. Um, if I was to guess, though, I would say that if you're approaching something from like a Metal Gear Solid console exclusive game, in theory, um, your limits are probably there where it's like, yeah, like you can push the game, but like it's not going to get past 60 frames, right? Yeah. And so it's like, cool, that's cut off as long as the whole thing runs at 60. Great. Now with PC, you run into the issues of like, say you have the option to like build bigger worlds and like Sam could explore more or there could be more detail in the worlds in theory. But instead of getting that consistent 60, now like it's really easy for Sam to walk through an alleyway, but as soon as he gets to the edge of the alleyway, some computers are going to like tear it out at 120, and others are going to be dropping to like 80, 90, 70, 60. And then, yes. you know, some computers have really good graphics cards, but they cheaped out on the CPU and the RAM. And like, yes. <laughs> and there's, there's so many factors, I think, that it would just be so much more expensive to dial in. Like, how do you make something run on like a system that's has the newest part in it seven years old? That's also going to run on a computer system that every part in it is as old as two years tops. Yeah. Versus like a PS5, they all came from the same fucking manufacturer. They all have yeah. the same chips in them. I think I, it, computer development has to be more expensive. I, yeah, I know it's it's it has to be. I yeah. just I've just wondered like what's the ratio? Because for example, Sony brought over some big hits to PC the last little bit. They had God of War and what was the other big one that I was super stoked on? It's escaping me. Uh, Horizon. That's what it was. The first Horizon. Yeah. And the first Horizon PC port, like the first month, not great. And then it got patched and it's decent. The God of War PC port, it's phenomenal. And so I'm wondering, like, it's Sony's behind both of them. And I, and I, was, just, I was just thinking, I wonder what the difference is. Like, internally, are there the studios themselves are porting these things over? Or they have a small team in the studio and they're responsible. Because I would assume Sony has like some contract with a year PC port team, right? Yeah. That's what I would assume is happening. Or maybe it's because depending on how they design the game initially for the console, maybe it's harder, like the way that they architecture certain logic. Like, for example, if they tie things to frame rate, as you were saying, if they tie logic to frame rate, which is a, a big problem for emulators a lot of the time and why, like, when you enable 60 frames a second with an emulator on, say, lots of PS1 games, it breaks collision detection, and you can't climb up ladders and yeah. fall through walls and stuff, because all this logic was tied to frame rate. Um, I remember Hyperlight Drifters, like this indie Zelda, like, neon, like, top-down 2D action game, and it shipped at 30 frames a second, and a lot of people wanted it at 60 frames a second, and it took them like a year and a half, and they were very transparent in the developer log. Like we developed all the logic in this game is tied to frame rate. Like we're basically rewriting the entire game to make it 60 FPS compatible. It's like a mistake we won't make again. But so I know that that's like a big issue. So anyway, I'm rambling at this point. It's just it sucked with Elden Ring having to admit that PC was not in fact the master race for that experience at launch. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> PlayStation kind of needed needed a win too though because like yeah. look at like how much of a mess the console rollouts have been with the pandemic i mean i'm watching kids buy uh consoles and they're paying almost the price that they could pay a company to build a pc for them but they're still like gotta buy the console gotta have the ps5 in the house and i'm not disagreeing i'm gonna get a ps5 for myself at some point yes i will too yeah but there's it was so clearly like this whole pandemic as bad as the drought's been for us on pcs it's been way worse for console people so at least they got something good finally especially for the amount of money they're paying for this playstation because <laughs> like the pc shit will be fixed and then you'll you guys love scrolls enough souls sorry that uh you'll play elden ring again at some point and you'll go right back down the crackhead <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. And at that point, it'll be super patched and it'll play better than console. It will. Yeah. That, that's usually what happens. That's what, hap that's what happened to me 
quite frankly, with Witcher 3. I played it at launch. It was decent. And then they fixed lots of things. And I came back with the... I think we talked about this. I told you I would play Witcher uh, and tell you what I thought about it by the next oh, time that we did were you, talk. Did you do yeah. it? Yeah. Did the whole thing, all the DLCs? Oh, no, not the whole thing. I'm playing it like a real quest. Like I hop in, I go for a fight. I learn about a few plants and stuff. And then I hop off. Like, Are you... Uh, what are you playing on? Uh, on my PC. Okay, good. I... I was afraid so, you were going to say switch and I was going to get angry. No. So I've got a, so for the sake of the conversation, it's 2080 TI uh, turbo or super uh, from NVIDIA. And then uh, I'm playing on an Asus uh, monitor, like an Asus gaming one that does like two, what is it? 248 by whatever the specs are for that, but it's insane. It's the best visual setup I've ever had for gaming and the Witcher I have an Asus. I have the tough gaming Asus. I forget. It's not the OLED, so I will admit my blacks are not great. It does go to... I think yours might be better. I think mine only goes to 60 hertz. Um, I don't have... So I got it because I thought it had G-Sync, which it kind of does. I basically read later that the reason why it was a, a cheaper model on their tough lining is it only... It's like I forgot what the stipulation was. There was some gear or specific type of oh man what was it it was a cable oh i had to use i couldn't use hdmi and i'm using the dvi for some other video stuff something with my setup but basically i don't really actually have g-sync unless i have to compromise on something else in my system it's just spacing me right now i can't remember what it was you have too much gear um, i know me too i had to pull up my specs for you so my cpu is an amd ryzen 9 uh, 3090 XT. That's not bad. No, it's fucking great. And it's really good for uh, my music production. I don't go over more 20, than like 20, I was gonna 20%. Say, I was going to say 26. Yeah. Be like your yeah, max like 30. I'm, I'm hitting 30 and it's not going past 30. And that's with like five different synths running and all the effects plugins. And then my motherboard is an Asus uh, ROG Strix uh, X570. So the ROG, the ROG Strix is my favorite. Look, that's usually what I get. I've always had, I've had a ROG Strix card for the last four GPUs. Um, I don't think that's my motherboard. I did with Unspeakable for my PC. I paid, for, I paid for someone to build it this time. I've done that. Yeah. I did. A lot of people get mad. It's like, I just, I had a little extra money. The graphics cards were, I, the ROG specific Strix 3090 that I wanted was impossible to get. Like, impossible. And so I was like, fuck. And I had bought a, a, a Alienware Dell pre-built just to get a 3090. And I had a 2080 Ti prior in my old rig. I just, I don't like not being able to play games. I have like OCD. Well, dude, I have to pay money like that towards technology. Like that's the thing a lot of people don't understand in my case. Like my write-offs at the end of the year have to be substantial because of my earnings and being like a self-run business. Like I don't wake up in the morning and go work for somebody else. And then like they give me my checks and then everything's handled in the checks. And then I'm waiting once a year for a big payout. If I don't have the proper write-offs in place, I am getting ganked on taxes every year. So that extra $700 like transaction of like shipping and development of that PC actually ends up saving me like thousands of dollars. Yeah. Cause if it drops you a tax bracket for sure. Massively, Cause yeah. it's all right. I can write all of it off because I use it for everything. Um, I do but, too. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I was trying to convey is like, I get it from like an economic standpoint. It's way more money than you should have to spend to get the computer together. Yes. From like an adult, like, hey, I have to find a way to not get ganked by the government on taxes <laughs> for being like a free person and having more of a free schedule and lifestyle. Like, I have to strategically burn some cash so I don't have to burn 3x that amount of cash. That is in my mind, generally speaking, when it comes to any purchase, because I know things that are kind of legitimately right off. Uh, another reason I did it is the price of 3090s were so high. And I'm like, okay, if I, I went through PC Part Picker, I found this PC on a site called Alexander PCs. They basically are a boutique builder. You don't really pick a build. They just, they're like PC nerds and they build a handful of computers that are like their wet dreams a month and then they sell them. But it's like a superior PC that they're building compared to like, the array that you find on cyber power and stuff, which is like levels from like one to 10 of dopeness. Yes. Yeah. The craftsmanship is, is on, it's like I said, it's so ridiculous, but I, I, I went through it on PC part picker and I'm like, okay, how much extra am I actually paying for this? Like there's the write off perspective. There's also like, what would I pay to get this, this GPU right now after market? versus in in this rig what's the retail price um what do i get with the pc it's a lifetime warranty i talked to them on the phone like they they said they claimed and i checked out reviews on reddit and so forth that if in seven years a hard drive fails, they'll send me a new one it's lifetime like life 
these are like custom built handcrafted like boutique they say lifetime warranty on every single part I'm like okay uh-huh. you know if they if they uh if they actually fulfill on that that could be really awesome i don't really know but i i took their word for it and then i added it added it all up and i ended up i was paying about nine hundred dollars which is a significant amount of money for them to build it over on top of the parts and not not including the lifetime warranty like 900 bucks like it's not a ton of money if i just went and bought all those parts mainly because the gpu i could not you could not get for retail but that's that's where i go back to our original conversation and point it's like the person who you know would give me a hard time about that 900 dollars right is not wrong but my response to them wouldn't be like defending myself or the fact that i did it for convenience or whatever it would simply be, okay, like that's how you feel about the nine hundred dollars I've spent. Like, have you ever managed your own business and like seen how the government treats like a business <laughs> and handles it compared to like a human being who like works for a business? Like we we went the other day to uh like a store to pick up some yard uh stuff, you know, just like uh grass uh weed whacker things like tools and parts that you would need for the spring to take care of our yard and when we were checking out we specifically paid with cash because the guys who run the business it's a small business it's not tied to a corporation they don't like affiliate with home depot or lowe's like they really are like a mom and pop shop that has expanded and taken over to become like a very successful small outdoor business but last year the guy was telling us that their company ate 1.2 million dollars in credit card transaction fees so that means like money that like was coming in being bought for like tractors yard material seed grass fertilizer like 1.2 million they'll never see because it got lost through the transaction fee with the credit cards that they have to eat as a company which all bleeds into their profits you know what i mean i mean it's so yeah like it's 900 dollars. but like tell me if like you'd rather lose 900 dollars on the pc or like three grand at tax season. <laughs> yeah. If you understand that, then you're probably not going to give me a hard time about my ways of handling uh, Uncle Sam putting his hand in my pocket harder than he does for somebody who, you know, doesn't run their own company. I would say the only counter argument to that I would I, or I could give yeah. myself personally that I would agree with that you know the, I still have the most recent PC that I built. So I, I built one. I built a bunch, but I built one with a 2080 Ti, almost your same card. And then I bought an Alienware just to get the 3090 in and this pre-built. I still have that original one. I do love that computer more because I built it. Like there's, Absolutely. there's a connection. So I would say that's the one downside. Like I look at my PC and I, and I sometimes I'll just look at it and be like, God, they're so good. The cable management is perfect. Everything about it is perfect. But it's not mine. It's not like it's not my art. You know what I mean? So Yeah. But I also I didn't like build the car that i drive you know i've fixed up a bike and i love the bike for what it is but like i've never like taken apart and rebuilt a car um i would also argue in the case that like some people just don't have the time anymore like some people have kids some people have full-time jobs and like one of the benefits of that is like i don't have the time to get all these pieces together have them in my house like maybe they don't have the space to to have their own separate office right in theory so like you can't just have ram sitting around for two days while like the dogs and cats are like running on top of your tower yes Yes. and (laughs) like everybody in every case is different i would just say it's not as simple anymore as like oh you didn't build the pc so it's not as dope to me it's like okay well that was before graphics cards cost as much as uh tower complete tower <laughs> of a small sh- shitty used car dude yeah yeah they got crazy. Man, like it's just it's not the same world anymore from like a perspective of like tech is way higher value than it used to be i think uh nvidia's stock is climbed <laughs> to like 200 300 a share which is insane to think about because before the pandemic it was sitting somewhere around like 60 dollars. wow i didn't know that i don't i haven't been following stocks at all Two, $276 currently. Yeah. And when I got into NVIDIA, it was trading for $27. And that was in April of 2017. Damn. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. yeah. Wow. They, they, they peaked out in November at $329 a share. Like that's insane. Graphics card companies are becoming like competitive with like Apple stock. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. That is crazy. Damn. 
I had no idea. I checked out. I did a. I did some stock trading with the dip in the pandemic. I did have some people that I trusted kind of explain like this is probably going to be a temporary dip and a great time to buy. So I went for it. Uh, bought a lot of Tesla. I bought airlines after they crashed. Yeah, and yeah. Then, uh, I got rid of them all. I moved it on to crypto, and I haven't looked back since. But uh, maybe I sh- maybe I should because that I, mean, I did have a good run with stocks. But I felt like the pandemic was such an easy. I didn't have a lot of what's the word? I didn't have a lot of hesitation. I, I understood enough that I thought, yeah, this is going to temporarily displace stock prices, but these these companies are not going to go under. Not all of them. I mean, the other thing though that my guy teaches me is that uh, historically the market's been massively overvaluated for years. So the pandemic was more of the correction that it needed in the first oh, place. Made it a little more healthy. Yeah, because it's, I mean, the same issue that we saw in 08 with the housing market crash with CDOs and saying that like this investment is more sound because it's a shit investment, but it's lumped in with a bunch of other shit investments. So it makes it more of a sound investment for somehow. Um, it's basically just those who are in charge of selling items repackage it as shit and then sell it and say it means more. It's more than it's worth. And then eventually that item crashes. And then that's when we see the price across the board be like, oh, this is what the market's actually worth versus what people were throwing at it thinking it was yes. worth that. Yes. Um, I got into graphics cards though, because everybody was trying to get me to get into like XRP uh, uh-huh. and stuff back in the day. And uh-huh. I was like, I'm touring. I don't have the time to learn about crypto, but all these like coins are, mar- are mined through graphics cards at the time. And I was like, how about I just invest in NVIDIA? And if the mining becomes like a very successful thing and the coins do well, that will help push NVIDIA's stock price up. And then if crypto crashes, in theory, I'm still in a company that handles like computer uh, graphics cards, phones, tablets. Yeah. So that's how I figured out that uh, NVIDIA was something to worth looking into because it uh, handles so many different utilities. It's a good point. I have a, I have a couple of friends that have, have bought quite a few graphics cards just to mine. And their, lo- their logic was similar. It's like, look, um, I can still resell these later. They still have use outside of mining. And then I get a, I get a say I resell them for 60% of the cost, but they've made me triple their cost in the lifetime of mining. I think that's a good assessment. And all of them I know that have spent a lot of money. I know one friend in, in uh, really well who spent upwards of like 60K of money he'd been saving up. It was like a big play for him. He kind of, he'd been deciding what to do from what I understand. And he got 30 some odd alien wares with like 30 nineties and th- various 30 eighties took them wow. all apart. He really went, went for it. He went yeah. for it. He built like custom swamp coolers in his shed that was attached to his house, ran like a custom power thing, um, got it all set up. And I know, I know he broke even like I, w- I want to say at least like four to six months ago. Um, That's good. I think it's going to work out for him. And at, at, and at any point, he could turn around and sell those graphics cards for or those computers. I think he's already liquidated all the computer parts that were, that came with the pre-builds. Yeah, smart. But um, yeah, it's 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 like they say. What's that that famous saying when it comes to the gold rush? Like some people made a lot of money on the gold. A lot of people made more money selling pickets and yeah. The actual like hardware guys were the ones who were making a killing because there was new people showing up every day who needed pans to go panhandle for the gold. <laughs> so I think that's pretty good logic. Nvidia, they uh, man, I've just been a fanboy of them for a long time. I've always, I've, I've never, well, since I started building my own PCs and getting into PC game, I've never not had an Nvidia card. I played around with Intel and AMD and other brands, but I've always gone with Nvidia. They have a good, they have, I think they have good, like legit brand loyalty as well. On top of all of that, yeah, I also like that. Just from my perspective, they've really like connected a lot with game developing companies to where a lot of the patches that I get now can be dedicated to specific games that I play. So I like that they're going like one step further to say like, hey, if you're using our cards, you're actually going to get a better experience than you would if you were using other uh, graphics, which to me at the core is why I have graphics cards in my life is to game. <laughs> yes, that's part of number one. And then they mine, they mine when they're not gaming. Um, yeah, no, my, the Ethereum that I've been mining has been massively successful yes. too. So like, it's, it's cool. It's just make sure if you're mining just to add this like, Watch your temperature levels. <laughs> yes. I, uh, I, I, I burned my 20. So I killed my 2080 Ti from mining. Really? I started mining Ergo, which is uh, Charles has been talking about them. They're a proof of work chain that's integrating with the DEX on Cardano. And Charles was ranting about how their proof of work model is the most superior and it doesn't use that much power. And 
retains anyway. So I, I started mining them. I invested a little bit of Cardano because they were building a DEX on Cardano. And then I started mining and it was like a lot of homebrew miners, not like NiceHash, right? NiceHash doesn't support Ergo. And I had been mining on NiceHash with Bitcoin, no problems that with multiple cards for probably over a year. And I switched this one rig over to Ergo and within like four months, it, it just died. And I, I, it was having like these crazy temperature spikes that I wasn't noticing because I just assumed it was going to run the same as everything else because I had my whole system was basically dialed in. Yeah. And I just didn't think about it. And I'm pretty sure I killed the old faithful 2080 Ti, which I had a connect. I had a, I would connect that was like probably the most hours of gaming on any card I've owned was that 2080 Ti. Same and, with the one that I currently have. Yeah. And I felt, I'm like, man, I killed it in the mines. Like I felt a little bad about it, but it is what it is. You got to watch your temps for sure. For Definitely. sure. I, I essentially set mine to be really light. Like both my cards mine constantly when I'm not gaming that I have running right now, but I don't mine aggressively with them. I'd rather just mine a little bit like, yeah, I could probably get a few more mega hashes out of this, but I don't even want to risk frying another card. It's not worth it. No, we just use ours uh, when we're all asleep. So like basically if like the computer's not being used, that's when they mine. And then if somebody sees the computer, the mining stops and that's worked pretty well for us with regulating our temps. So the Witcher three. Yeah. Um, I want, how many hours in are you? Uh, I would say I've got 12 or so. Okay. Okay. I'm early, but like, to be fair, it's, I'm not approaching it from like, I need to beat this game. I'm approaching it from every expansion that I need. I have for the game. I got it for a super sweet deal during the holidays. And I have literally every quest, every option that I want to explore. So I really want to experience it from a true, like, I don't miss a single conversation. Yes. I don't miss like one interaction with one person. I want to trade every item I can to somebody to see like what comes from that. I want to explore under every bridge, dig for every like sunken treasure, water lily, <laughs> the ocean. Um, that, that's, a, that's a lot for that game. I did that. Yeah. Yeah. For the first most part of it. Well, because I'm not going to get another one like this for a very long time for a first playthrough. Well, you have Elden Ring, which I'll tell you right now. When we talked previously, Elden Ring didn't exist. True. And Witcher 3 was the pinnacle. Witcher 3 is no longer the pinnacle. Okay. That's good to know. It's uh he, for, you would prefer to play Elden Ring over uh Witcher stuff now? There are aspects of Witcher that are vastly superior to Elden Ring, but okay. my personal total enjoyment, um Witcher 3 was my number one game for hours spent on Steam until Elden Ring. So it's not it's not that Witcher 3 is not good. Witcher no, 3 is extremely yeah. good. It's uh, Elden Ring. I'm like I'm about 140 hours now on it, and I'm gonna do a new game plus at some point. So I bet I'll get so which will go quicker, but I bet I'll get to 150 to 160 hours on that game. And Witcher Three is at 130. That's with all the DLCs. There's different stuff though that I noticed from like all the footage I watched of like Elden Ring, right? Like I like watching like a streamer walk up to a dragon in a swamp and yes. watch that dragon navigate itself, but also like fly from one side of the swamp to the other. And then like it climbs up on a house and then is like walking on the house while it's fighting. It's not just like treating it like a mounded, like spherical object when it's not spherical. Like it's very much so like the AI is a part of that world and you're experiencing all of it in this beautiful, like two towers epic of fight where just like every piece matters and every piece is beautiful. However, I also like just being uh Gerald and like walking through the woods and like tracking like something's footprints <laughs> and like meeting characters of like a local village and learning more about the lore, which I feel Witcher has, or sorry, Elden Ring has like an incredible story and like the AI and the beauty of the game visually pretty much. There's nothing I can even compare it to right now, but for like a, just take me to like a world where I feel like I am that Witcher character and I am like interacting with the people there where I can choose like to either take their money or not take their money, you know, arguably uh, <laughs> going against like the true core nature of a Witcher. <laughs> but <laughs> like having that choice to experience the AI in that world is more traditionally of what I want to experience right now from a game versus just crazier and crazier and crazier boss fights. <laughs> yes. The Souls, have you played any other Souls games? 
No, but I watched three. So the last time I worked on an album out of out of uh, my own studio, the house I was staying at, the guy was playing Dark Souls three at the time. And like when we were done writing, we'd basically sit down on the couch, and I was too fried to even game. So I would sit there and watch him just you know dungeon crawl after dungeon crawl. And the thing I really liked about uh, three, just to add this compared to Elden, is I enjoyed watching him dungeon crawl as much as I enjoyed him fighting the bosses in three uh where Elden like the game itself was cool but i was pretty much just waiting for the next boss fight and that was the big difference i've noticed between the two games hmm. so far interesting yeah the i would agree that the the premise of all souls games is the the world is basically ended and there's some sort of like disaster that's happened and you're picking up the pieces and figuring out what happened everyone's okay mainly dead Elden Ring is no different. So yeah, you're not going to have towns where you can interact with people and there's like, I can go to the bar and drink and maybe mug this guy because there's like, everyone's dead. There's just a handful of- five different NPCs with five different opinions about my, you know, species. Yes. Yeah. yeah that, that's all. It's more like there's only a few people left and like this world is in ruin and what happened? And I'm, I'm going to, and, and this all is epic. You can ascend the throne and you can choose whether to like what you want to do with the kingdom and it's, which is sick. Which yeah. is a recurring theme. So I would agree. It's a. It's not a traditional open world experience like that. But also traditional open world experiences don't offer boss fights like that. Yes. So. Yeah. <laughs> like there's there's quest lines, but it's mainly like you're just alone and you don't really know what's going on and you're trying. You're kind of piecing it together. And yeah, there's the set pieces are epic. You're trying to. It's like a mystery. You most. It has like a detective element because as you play, you get little hints and you read item descriptions and you start to put together. And I'd be texting my brother like, "Hey, I think this group may have done this." And he said, "Yeah, I think there's something up with these people." And probably this happened. That, that's why we saw this element in the catacombs and we saw this painting in that place and stuff like that. That can be so if, if that interests you, that would be really fun. Um, but The Witcher 3 is better. I, I guess I should probably preface Elden Ring is vastly superior in a couple narrow verticals than any other open world game. And, and I would agree with you on that. And it's decent yeah. on everything else. But because it's such it's such a giant leap forward in like an open world map design and the density and the, the layers, it's uh that was such a surprise to me, the way the world interconnects and works. I've never seen in an open world game. The best way I could describe it is in most open world games, you zoom out to your map, you have your map, and there's some verticality with mountains, but it's just kind of like a, a flat playing field with different locations. Mm-hmm. Elden Ring is like there's the the level of verticality and interconnectedness and layers is like it's, it's next level. It's next level, and so yeah. I, I might be biased because that made exploring so fun. I I don't think you are though. I just think you're right. I think that's there's there's a difference between being like one sided and there's just also you have experience in both worlds, so you have an appreciation for what they're doing, which is pushing the genre forward, which desperately needs. Yes. Also, a timing thing. You're probably right because the genre. I've heard Horizon Frozen Wild. I think it's the second one. Whatever the second one's called, I forget. Is really good, but it's it's the re, it's the formula we've all been playing refined to a T. No, for sure. And like part of where I'm coming from with it is not like I don't want to play Elden Ring. I do, but I'm coming off of like a five to seven year binge <laughs> of like Battle Royale games. Oh, yeah. We talked about this. Yes. And like that's not an easy thing to like transition from. And like I'm coming back to this world of like the last RPG that I really got into was Skyrim. Uh. And then, like, before that would have been Gothic. And, like, I don't want to play Skyrim again. I tried getting Gothic back on my computer, had to get a whole bunch of, like, Russian mods that I just didn't even trust, so I ended up deleting it before I could even get the game to properly work. Um, And then there's, like, a whole thing about them trying to remake Gothic right now, but the beta I played just was a mess compared to what the original game looked like. Anyways, The Witcher is, like, the closest thing I can get to right now to, like reconnect with like that side of gaming that basically was my introduction to pc gaming um and if to go with what you said i'd if i'm going to play elden ring i know it's going to be there just like dark souls is going to be there but i definitely would want to play elden ring when it's polished and it's not better yes. on console than it is on PC. Yes, so. <laughs> that's a, if you're not dying to play it, I would agree. No, yeah, <laughs> but agree. that's again why I'm glad I'm playing The Witcher right now because I'm not having any hiccups with the game. There hasn't been a single like, what's going on here? Like, why 
like there's i'm not running to any bugs it's insane <laughs> there's uh have you have you done put any mods on it or are you playing vanilla vanilla okay the only thing i would recommend there's a couple like ui mods that i would say are worth considering even on okay. your first playthrough but the number one for me it's a small thing but for those who played the witcher know that there's a small chance when you have combat with human enemies or like human like enemies with arms and legs that are your size there's a chance when you kill them you'll dismember them and that goes with the lore that how strong witchers are and every once in a while you kill someone and like you'll chop them in half or cut their arm off but it's pretty rare it's, okay. it's really cool there's a mod that you can set like the ratio of how often that happens oh i like that and yeah. i just for some reason bumping that up made me feel just so much more badass walking around as Geralt. Like I can chop a man in half if he fucks with yeah, me. Yeah, it's absolutely. Uh, it, I I felt it raised my experience. No, I, I I'll have to hit you up for those two. I mean, to be fair too, though, if Elden Ring had like a Netflix series right now that was phenomenal, um, I'd be more inclined to like lean towards Elden Ring. But like I'm so locked in with Witcher lore right Did now. You uh, you watch season two? No, we just rewatched season one and we're about to start season two. We got sidetracked by this Architect 81 series. People on have been talking Netflix. about that. Is that it's good? It's interesting. It's pretty interesting. We're only a couple episodes in, but it's like a combination of like found footage mixed with like uh, dark cult activities. Mm. Basically, a guy who restores film is hired by like oh, a private corporation. I watched this. I did finish this. Yeah. Yes. What'd you think? <sighs> okay. Uh, I, without giving anything away yeah so i will <laughs> my biases are i like dark and occult things probably a little bit because of i i've always had these like images of mormon stuff but like flipped over the head and being like cool heavy metal like do you know much about baptisms for the dead did you learn about that when you're in utah no oh so this will be interesting when you uh mormons inside the temple like they're special church buildings not the ones that anyone can go to you have to be a member and you have to pass like a worthy worthiness test to go into and it give 10 percent of like your estate or whatever after you pass all that yeah. yeah so there's like criteria and one of the criteria is paying 10 percent. yes correct and when you go there's you do like ordinances basically rituals essentially and mormons are kind of brought up into thinking it's normal and it's it's marketed internally as sort of the pinnacle of the belief system the, most, the programming yeah, yeah it's the pinnacle and it's really it's, it's very special and it means a lot to people who are into it and it's very sacred and uh and so that sort of kind of masks what it really is or what it looks like to an outsider and i was just recently talking about this with the one of uh guys i work with who's from out east and i showed him a picture of in the temple when you're 12 years old up until an adulthood the first thing you're allowed to do is what's called baptisms for the dead so you can't do all the different rituals in the temple until you've reached a certain age and a certain level, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But the very the entry level one you can do starting at twelve for both males and females is called baptisms for the dead, and it ties into the belief system that the LDS Church of Mormons believe that after this life there's a spirit world, like a like an interme an intermediate sort of existence before the judgment and then heaven purgatory. or hell, or whatever. Yeah, essentially purgatory. Correct. And in that space, people who did not have the chance to hear about Jesus or hear the things that they need to hear and to accept basically God's way will be given the chance. But you can't do the rituals needed to go to heaven without a body. The bodies are important in Mormon theology. They're an important part of the whole process and why we're here and having experience, which is interesting in its own regard. But what it applies to in this is you can't get baptized and accept Jesus through that ritual, which is... For whatever reason, God has decided that's a gate that everybody has to go through to go to heaven. You can't do that without a body. So at 12 years old, you go to a building, the temple, and there is a giant like baptismal font, like a bathtub, essentially. It's usually circling around, and it's on the back of 12 oxen that are facing outward that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. It's like a giant statue. of like, yeah. and, and you get in it, and you wear this white thing, and a person dunks you under the water in behalf of, in proxy of, someone who is dead which is heavy fucking metal and i didn't realize it till i was i'm like you it's like an occult ritual it's definitely right out of like a slayer lyric for sure <laughs> yes and as a kid as i laughed because i always viewed it as like this super special thing and then as i moved my way out of it and i we, and the reason i brought it up back to your question about being uh archive 81 i haven't forgot about it is i have like um i love the aesthetic of like heavy metal stuff essentially mm -hmm 
cults, rituals, Gothic architecture. Um, and I'm working Norwegian, like cult yes. magic practices that like existed in upper state New York for yes. like, to, like the early 1920s, which, which is, is like, exactly being... where womanism came from. Ha ha ha. <laughs> might be some Freudian <laughs> shit going on here, but <laughs> there might be some self therapy going on here. But the point is, um, like druids, I love the idea of druids too, like druid and alchemy, esoteric stuff and imagery. I've always found fascinating. I find uh, the uh, princes of hell extra fascinating in learning more about Christianity and Catholicism. The, what'd you uh, call it? The princes of hell? Princes of hell. What's so like that? everybody, everybody knows like Satan and the devil and all of that is like a concept, but there's like, if you dive deeper into the theories, there's like all these different like demonic princes and like basically like an evil medieval court style oh. of Lords of hell. And, uh, yeah, so I'm super into that stuff too because to me, they, it's like really well thought out books. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like really, really, really dope Comic Con s- styled uh, fan fiction. Yeah, it's, to, like, it sounds like what you're describing shit. is like the world and lore of hell. Like, yeah, 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 yeah which yeah. to me is like the same as like reading about like the lore of like the Star Wars universe at this point. <laughs> yes, it's things. cool. Exactly. That's that's almost exactly. <laughs> how I feel about it. Cause a lot of people, sometimes some guys I train with are like, dude, are you into like satanic shit? I'm like, I just think it's cool, dude. It's like same thing. It's not dissimilar to star Wars. You think star Wars is cool. I think that unit is cool to fantasize about lightsabers and Jedis. I do too. It's also cool to fantasize about evil druids that can do ancient esoteric magic and have rituals and allow them to astral travel. And like, there's cool shit there too. And uh, I've always really liked that. And Internet or Archive 81 starts out really strong, like really, really, really strong. And I'm by, and I'm the reason I went through that long tangent is because I'm biased heavily towards that subject matter. And so I was very, I got really, I tried to tell my wife, you got to watch this. And I don't watch a lot of yeah. TV. And she's like, you're like, what is this? You're actually watching this. You won't watch Ozark. You won't watch all these shows that everyone loves because you're too busy doing whatever shit podcasts but you'll give this six hours of your life yes yeah. you'll watch archive 81 this looks lame so i just preface all of that it might be because it deals with like ancient gods and occult rituals mixed with technology it's it's awesome but- well i i genuinely believe too almost every scary movie i like has a terrible ending like it's just kind of like tradition with horror that like they start well and some start like incredibly well, but I'm almost always disappointed by the end of horror. <laughs> well, you're going to be disappointed at the end of Archive 81. Yeah, no, but like if anything, that's like status quo at okay. this point. <laughs> but it, dude, it's so good. Up, like the first 60% was, I, I had to keep watching. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, no, we're, so we're digging it for sure. I, the other thing I've gotten really into screenwriting over the last few years and like, I love specifically writing horror and things like that. So shows like that for me are less about like the experience. Like I love, I love the, what I'm getting from the story, but I use it more as like a database for collecting ideas for myself to write out my own stories, and my own concepts. Cause I don't know. I just fear to me is something that like controlled my life drastically as a kid of like being afraid of the unknown or ghosts and spirits and things like that. Like it would keep me up as it's night as a kid. And then some t- point when I became an adult, I just fully embraced it. And now like I celebrate fear. Like it's an exciting thing. I get to still enjoy as an adult, like a pure feeling of like being scared and being excited and of the unknown. If it sucks, it sucks, but at least there's a lot of cool concepts there for me to build off of because that's at the end of the day, what I need is just more things to make life interesting. <laughs> yes, I do. I do a very similar thing. I like consuming content to fuel ideas for the own worlds that I just build in my head or yeah. ideas that I maybe one day I'll get to do this video game idea. Or for me, it's been working on, I've been doing tunes with my brother, which is they're, they're uh, dark and we're like channeling all the sort of visual cues we like and we have a mood board on pinterest and i actually just ripped some images from that show that was like these images kind of have an aesthetic and vibe that i think could apply to this project we're working on the shows god man the, I, you are right I'm, i was trying to think as you were talking of an example of a horror movie that didn't end bad and i couldn't think of one so <laughs> the only one maybe is uh, cabin in the woods oh yes but that's, that's also- maybe the, that's maybe the only one that i could say like yeah like fucking amazing ending <laughs> I, so I wasn't thinking of those because Cabin in the Woods is sort of comedy. 
<laughs> yeah, no, no, but I throw it in there just because it's a celebration yeah. of horror. <laughs> but if, if that's uh, if Cabin in the Wood counts, I think Drag Me to Hell ending. I haven't is- seen Drag Me to Hell. Oh, well, spoiler alert. Should I? Yeah, see it. I don't want to say it. <laughs> she becomes cursed, places a curse on her, threatening her soul with the element of damnation, seeks a psychic to help break the curse, but the price to save her soul may be more than she can pay. Yeah, I'll watch this for so, sure. <laughs> yeah, basically, ju- it's like they play on this like romantic comedy, and like Justin Wong is trying to save her because she he doesn't believe it, and they realize that yeah. the curse is real. And spoiler, he's great, by the way. Yeah. Spoiler alert: like he fucking fails, and she gets dragged to hell, and she's Sick. damned. <laughs> it's so like metal, and I loved it. I loved it. So, but that was comedy. I, I yeah, if we count that, I think Cabin in the Woods my, is probably my number one. I'm glad you brought that up. It's my yeah. number one. That's out of all of them, I would say, and this is blending, of course. I love watching the first Conjuring film just because I think it's like the best presentation of like a haunted house I'd ever seen. I mean, Haunting of Hill House is incredible, but just for sheer like terror, every time I watch The Conjuring, I'm like, holy fuck, I would not want to have to live in that house even for like 10 minutes. That, <laughs> like, dude, that movie sent me down. We talked about aliens last time, and I'm how, yeah. how we're both willing to listen to consider sort of things that are considered fringe or whatever i went down paranormal rabbit hole because i had never seen the conjuring and i knew it was loosely based on some real events Mm -hmm. so i watched the movie i enjoyed it i agree i really really enjoyed it then i watched some stuff online did a bunch of research listened to some podcasts about the book of one of the girls who actually lived there listened to some podcasts kind of like criticizing the book and whether these people were telling the truth or not and who the Warrens really were. And I went down this huge, probably three and a half, four month rabbit hole. Wow. All I listened to is I'm like, okay, I've done the alien thing. Let's do the ghost thing. That's dope. And I'm, I'm wondering if you've done similar dives and like, what level of confidence do you give those type of stories? Like, are we talking specifically horror now? Not aliens, just to clarify. Just, yeah, not aliens. We talked about that last time, but... No, no, I know. I'm just clarified before I give my answer. Because for me, they're two very different worlds. Yeah, well, um, I would say paranormal sort of technically encompasses all of it. But what I mean when I say paranormal is generally like ghosts or that kind no, of... No, no, for, for sure. For sure. I just wanted to clarify because I have much more like sound understanding of how I feel about space yeah. and like other life forms versus like entities. So. My general take on that is the, the the standard concept of like you walk into a graveyard and then you see like a specter haunting it, you know, who's like on paper, it looks like it's a caretaker, but actually it's like a spirit of the graveyard type thing. I've never seen anything like that. And I don't want to see anything like that. Um, hauntings to me have become more of an interesting conversation, though, as I've watched these new films come out like Oculus and uh, other haunting films that are more about perspective and basically talking more about dimensional haunting. The idea that like things could exist, but maybe we don't see them within our plane of existence. Yeah. And the idea that like it could be around me right now, but I, don't, I wouldn't know it's here because of my perspective on everything. And I find that idea much more like fathomable than like a lady died in a house and now her spirit walks around the house every night at 3 a.m. type of thing. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Like, I like the idea of like existences within like a current existence. But then if you go there, it's like, are we all technically ghosts of our own reality? And there's like another reality outside of this one that we've already experienced. And now we're just echoing like the reconnection here. (laughs) That's uh, it's funny you mentioned that. The conclusion (laughs) I've come to is I think there might be some sort of echo that exists with people because. Because when you say there might be some entity that exists in a reality that we can't perceive, you could also say, well, maybe there's a part of you that exists in a reality that you don't perceive mm-hmm. consciously. And that that and it's only part of you. It's obviously not all of you, because when someone dies, they're gone. We all know that. Pretty much everybody but who's knows to say that. like we haven't already died once already. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the reason and so so I've I've thought about the idea of an echo. <laughs> The idea of an echo feels like I could be open to that idea. I agree. I came away from listening to a lot of ghosts and haunting stories feeling like this doesn't feel as credible as the UFO stuff. The UFO stuff has much stronger evidence. You have milts. It's just stronger evidence all around. But the flip side is I don't think all these people who are having these experiences are lying or just crazy. I think they really are having experiences, and I don't, I don't think there's nothing to this. I, uh, I, I sold alarms. I did door-to-door sales 
for years to get through college. And I, one family in particular that I sat down with, and while we were doing paperwork, you make small talk, right? You're just chitty chatting, making friends with them. And they were so nonchalant and casual about how they described a ghost that haunts their house. The kids, even the little kid, the little five year old, six year old was talking about it. They had a couple, like seven, eight year old, and they had one teenager and then the parents. And they were, and it wasn't like a weird woo woo thing. And it wasn't, they were like very normal looking suit and tie kind of guy like looked like an accountant just very like classic suburban family nothing seemed odd or about them and they were so nonchalant about a ghost that haunted their house and the kids would talk about how the ghost would turn lights off and play pranks on them and they said that they believed it was the previous owner who had died in the house they feel like it's the same woman and that it's not necessarily a malevolent ghost but the way they spoke about it's it, just happy to have company yeah, that's like their perspective on it. Yeah. And it, I was most shocked about their demeanor and when communicating the story. It was, they weren't lying. I mean, that's what every fiber. But they talked my- about it like as if it was a next door neighbor, yes. like a part of their day to day interaction. Like, they, like you should not be surprised with yes, what they're saying. You should saying. not be surprised. And they would have like inside <laughs> jokes. And then the kid would be like, haha. And they had a name for her. And the kid would be like, ha, do you remember when she did this and this? And they would all start busting up laughing and be like, yeah. And then that one time, and they're like, yeah, it's crazy, man. Go surreal. See, but like, I, I believe that like could be a thing right like i believe that like they could be experiencing that and that could ab- absolutely exist just because i haven't seen that doesn't mean it's not true i tend though to lean more on like my true beliefs falling with if you read about like ancient american tradition like looking like past like the founding of the country and look at movies like the witch if you saw the witch i haven't okay like the whole concept of the witch is like uh settlers uh, setting up in Massachusetts, uh, a group of like a family who lives on that like settlement plantation is banished to the woods uh, for basically denouncing God. And as their banishment begins in the woods, that's when witchcraft seems to start to enter their life. It's like they let go of God and in turn welcomed all the things God was in theory protecting them from. Right. So if I look back at like that part of the lore of like American culture with like the Salem witch trials, the gnarly stuff that people used to do to other like people in like the name of religion and things like that. And then you tie in sane asylums, like all like state penitentiary, sane asylum things that are all up and down the East Coast. Um, And then like the Devil's Highway out in New Jersey, which is just like a tunnel that gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, but it goes for like, you know, 10, 10, 20, 30 miles deep, almost like into the earth stairways to hell that just seem to endlessly go into the ground from graveyards. I've, I've read super into this stuff. So I'm sorry if I'm rambling. Um, No, keep going. I'm I'm not listening. Keep going. My, my theory and interest in it is more that like, regardless of all those things, I believe in energy. And I believe that like energy ripples through time. And I do feel that like, if you look at like those insane asylums, these crazy places, like basically burning witch graveyards, areas of the woods where they maybe used to go and like, you know, burn people at a stake or hang them out in the forest, like out in parts of like Massachusetts. I wouldn't be surprised if like entities and energies like gravitated to that spot so it's like could like the spirit of that witch be haunting the space sure but like equally in that conversation um could like other dark entities be like <laughs> magnet magnetically like pulled to that yes. area and that's what's haunting that space because such negative shit went on and such ignorant shit went on that it led to like a proverbial uh every action has a reaction type of thing But at the core of it, I feel Hollywood does a terrible job of translating all of that. I feel they they go from the idea of like what the fear I would get out of a concept of watching like the thing (laughs) with Kurt Russell and how terrified I am of like a parasite taking over a camp and destroying everybody and like the fear and all of that. It's gone from like that type of horror to jump scares. (laughs) Yeah. And that shit's super lame because now a conversation about ghosts is like, well, I've never been jump scared. So ghosts must not be a real thing. It's like, no, man, there's so much more to that conversation. There's the psychological aspect of the terror. There's like the losing of time. If you ever saw Oculus, there's a bunch of really good scenes where like the character thinks they're biting to an apple, but it it turns out they're actually biting to a glass light bulb (laughs) because the energy and spirit around them is like manipulating their perception of reality. Like that shit to me is way more interesting than yes. Like a spirit just jumping out and going, boo. <laughs> yeah. Like hiding in the corner at the perfect time. And you turn around and you just yeah. see a face there. 
But yeah. like to me, that's like if we're talking about ghosts, we have to almost eliminate that from the conversation right away because yeah. there's so much more to like a haunting than just like the jump scare. The similar, I came to some similar ideas after going through this binge on paranormal content was that yeah. maybe there is some sort of imprint of something really negative happened like an imprint on the space time of reality and maybe yeah. that, maybe that can attract other energies or maybe it's like magnets because i don't again i keep coming back it's sort of one of the things i've thought about when it comes to aliens i don't think all these people are full of shit i just don't, I don't either i just don't um you no know, i've never had a paranormal experience i'm with them you i've never had any sort of thing i have seen a ufo which i think we talked about but i've never had we did but I've never had a paranormal experience. Um, there were some things that I ran across that I wanted to run by you as well. Have you learned much about the phenomena of children claiming memories of past lives? I was actually, yeah, I was going to pro- bring that up. Like children that were like born at any time in like the last 20 years who like feel like they fought in World War II or something like that. It's fucking gnarly. There's a, there's a speaking of Netflix series, it's not great all the way through. There's a handful of episodes. It's called Surviving Death. And it's like a docu-series, and they look at different aspects that are related to death. The first two episodes focus primarily on near-death experiences, and they're very strong. Highly recommend. And then they get they get into mediums, people who communicate to dead people when someone had a loved one die. And I, I couldn't tell. That it's very, they just, the style of the documentary is they just interview the people, and they show the thing, and there's no one like giving their take on it. It's, it's like left up to you to decide. I really felt like the people that were mediums were just full of shit. That's what I just like. This is a scam. The first two episodes, near death experiences, strong. I know they happen. They've been documented. They had people from various universities that have been researching patterns and of events that are near death experiences and trying to find commonalities. And then they and then they go through this medium ghost story stuff, but they end with near death experience or excuse me, past life memories of children. And what I didn't know is that this is a, an extremely for a phenomenon. It's very common. It's and it's been happening. It's been it's been documented in the United States. There's a uh, parapsychology departments, I guess, at like Harvard and MIT, Cambridge, and all these renowned universities. They show people from different departments saying, like, yes, we have documentation from cases, alleged cases, all the way back to like 1920 in the East. It's even more common. Um, you don't really have people talking about it in the West. It's just like parents don't seem to report when their kids claim that. But they highlight a few a few American cases where, and it's all three of them are almost the exact same scenario. A kid starts telling things to the parents. The dad gets really obsessed. Like something's going on here. And the dad tracks down, figures out who they remember being. And then it ends up getting pulled into like a certain person that I forget his name. There's a guy at Harvard that's in a department. He specifically researches these cases and tries to bet them. And they bring the guy on and they, they have this person they suspect the child remembers living as and they bring in like four different women pictures of women one of them is the the previous person's mother and they say which one is the mom and what they show in the documentary is 100 percent accuracy on all three of these kids and i thought it was pretty compelling and then i started diving into it more and it is a very common for something that's uncommon it's common in the sense of there are hundreds and hundreds of cases that have been documented that have been researchers that have been vetted and if you go globally potentially a lot more and i had no idea the volume was so high and it comes back to that same line of logic do i think all of these kids are crazy do i think all these kids are lying all it takes is one of them to be telling the truth to to matter there might be something there what do we actually know about anything nothing we just know what we've been presented yes like that's the entire to go back to what we're talking about it's the entire theme of what makes me love like slayer for example it's like Slayer isn't there to ruin somebody's life. Slayer's there to like just fucking challenge somebody's echo chamber yes. and like have them perceive it from another perspective. Step out of it and say, do I want to live outside of this echo chamber or do I want to step back into it? So if you look at like world communication and connection, at least like post Ice Age, everything pretty much revolves around like organized religion and concepts of organized religion. So through that, like how much of it is truth? How much of it is uh, overlapping concepts of just good ways to like treat people versus bad ways of living? And then how much of it is like suppression? Like we don't know, like we can challenge it and say we might know, but at the end of the day, like we don't really understand like what existed on this planet before we were here. We also don't know 
what's actually currently going on around all of us, aside from what people choose to tell us on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, <laughs> so yes, we yes, only, it's like the whole, like if a tree falls in the forest, does it make any fucking noise? In theory it does, but how does anybody know if they're not there? So like some crazy, like, you know, spiritual shit could be happening in a graveyard right now, but we wouldn't know because we're not there for it. Yeah. I think about, um, <laughs> simple things such as we only see a small percentage of the, of the light spectrum. We, I know all of us here, a very small percentage. That's a great example. That's a great right? example. So you can have yeah. things that exist just on the light. We don't see the radio waves. I don't see the Wi-Fi waves. They're there and they influence us. And in- well, in frequencies and what we hear, we only perceive yes, so much of sound. Only so much. And exactly. So with like those kids experiencing that, it's like, I can't really say if they are, or they're not, but I genuinely tend to believe that if you look at like ancient tribes, like somebody would be like a shaman and then they would die. And then I, in theory, like the next person was to take on to be that shaman and they would almost be inherently taking that person's life. And it becomes theirs because they took it from the shaman before that and the shaman after them. Yes. So they're part of something bigger, like things like this have existed in many different like versions. So Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I'm most bullish to use a crypto term on reincarnation. <laughs> I feel it resonates with me. I feel that there is some loose circumstantial evidence, like these children that claim to have past life memories. I don't. What I what I 100 percent believe is that they they are having the experience of remembering what to them is a past life. Because I know through psychedelics, and we talked about this last time, experimenting with astral traveling. Like you can have experiments, experiences. I don't know if those experiences are representative or real in the material sense. They could have just been in my mind. And maybe just in my mind is also real. I don't know. But what I do know is that you can follow a protocol with binaural beats that tune your brain to a super, to a sp- specific sort of resonance. And you can follow a visualization ritual and your body will freeze up and fall asleep, but your mind will stay awake. Maybe you're lucid dreaming. Maybe you're astral traveling. I don't know, but like you can do it. It's repeatable. You can have the experience. The CIA was into this shit. Um, Operation Stargate, like people, like to what you were saying about shamans, like people have been poking around at these ideas for a long time. Yeah, I just, I don't, I'm not super convinced on a lot of quote ghost stories, but I came away from that binge thinking there's probably something to all of this. Did you ever see uh, Lucy with Scarlett uh, Johansson? Yes, where she's is that where she's an alien and she takes over her body? No, no, it's where uh, her brain continuously becomes smarter and smarter and smarter. Oh and no, I have not seen that. I, I think that's the name of the film, but it's basically the film's documenting like how much of the brain we actually use, and then she takes some type of pill or something that slowly like opens up her brain, and she just, it's it's insane because at the beginning of it, she's very like much so worried about like money, bills, like small little like responsibilities that we all experience through like the day-to-day of life. But as her brain becomes more like dialed in and she's using more of it through technology, um, all these problems and like aspects of reality that she's put so much focus on have now become the equivalent of like doing a math problem. It's just like, it's, it's basic shit. So I just, I I'm done as a person. Like I spent way too many years of my life letting other people around me say like, well, that's not real why is it not real well i've never seen it and like that's the end of the conversation i'd way prefer to live in like an experience where like i discuss just concepts and interesting ideas because i don't know what all this becomes but if i collect and perceive reality from that perspective then at least whatever happens after this i have a buttload of cool stories to take with me as opposed to just doubting reality and then i leave reality just as just a yep, that wasn't real. This wasn't real. None of this meant anything. <laughs> well, I just I think it's <laughs> I think it's very presumptuous of people, and maybe it's why we both enjoy playing video games and, and dive, storytelling. Storytelling yeah. because I think there's more truth. I think well, one storytelling I believe has probably been a part of the human psyche and how we develop logic in the first place. And it's an ancient ancient thing. It's so I think we just love stories because that's the way our collective psyche is probably formed as we came out of whatever we were before. But I think it's presumptuous when you say, I'm going to experience reality, and that people can think they can say what reality is. No, the only person that can tell you what reality is is reality. You have to observe it. The only thing that can tell you the nature of reality is reality itself, and the only way you can 
it can, quote, tell you is for you to observe its behavior. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so people will say, like, well, all that's bullshit, or this is all bullshit, but, like, this is what's happening. I'm not saying it's necessarily past lives or it's a ghost, but what's happening is people are having these experiences. That's a reality. You can't just, like, put that in a box and be like, that's all bullshit. The, the, the pinnacle of what, what I think is the logos or logic or the scientific method is observing what reality tells you about itself. That is like the pure data that can that should be holy. And it's weird to say like, well, we're going to pretend like this little slice of reality is not real because it doesn't fit our model. Drives me insane. No, it, it's it's literally the entire like concept of what makes the Matrix such a good series of like breaking through to the other side. Like, I I genuinely believe that if you look at like tribes that like didn't discover like modern society and capitalism, but were like it was basically brought to them once it had already been established through explorers. Like if that tribe itself had believed that the earth was flat, right? And then they would go on to just think the earth is flat. It wouldn't be until somebody interjects like a concept of giving them the idea to challenge that belief yes. to say like, maybe the earth isn't flat. Like nobody there is going to really say anything otherwise. Like, unless you have an explorer of that group who, you know, makes the group think that way, but generally in an isolated setting where like mathematics, science, uh, engineering technology and things like that aren't pushed and it's based more around the storytelling and the traditions as opposed to challenging life like ideas are generally going to remain the same so if you like zoom out from that perspective humanity is the same concept just with more ideas like we are the equivalent of people living without lights on and no technology yes <laughs> metaphorically speaking when it comes to like exploring new ideas and concepts especially if it comes to different perspectives dimensions and anything that challenges like the ideals that have been programmed to us so yeah it's ignorant to say like well that can't exist um because it's not my reality it's like well it's not just about your reality if you're having a conversation with a human being <laughs> it's about learning from one another <laughs> it's about learning and it's it's weird that you, that can't exist because what they're really saying is that can't exist because my interpretation can't perceive it of what i observe doesn't make sense so it can't exist it can't be real but really it's just well maybe you're interpreting it wrong maybe it isn't if you don't believe in ghosts well maybe it isn't a ghost but you're never going to figure it out if you pretend like it's not happening i mean people are allowed like obviously to feel however they want to feel about life but i just know from my experience if i'm just constantly saying something isn't real or that's wrong or like dumb then I'm massively selling the experience of connecting with other people short. Yes. Yeah. That is also true. Yeah. And it's a very lonely life compared to like, if I believe in aliens and <laughs> concepts of space and uh, scary things real or not, like it just makes the day more interesting. I wanted to ask you earlier when you're talking about horror, what has been the most disappointing horror ending of any movie you've seen? What let you down the hardest? I guess the first one that comes to mind is I really like the found footage series, right? Blair Witch, the first time I saw it was pretty disappointing, but then it's like time went on. I actually ended up really liking the end of the series, the Blair Witch. I just hated that there was so much buildup and it was basically just ending with them running through the woods, ending up at that house. And then, you know, dudes look at the wall, she gets killed, dude dies. That's the end of it. Um, I definitely prefer like a horror experience that's similar to the conjuring the thing basically stuff that just keeps going and it's like you have a group of people cool have them all experience this in like a different way don't just like have the big haunt be five minutes left of the movie like that's why i think paranormal activity is such an interesting series because of how they build it where it starts with just like a door slamming Right, or a light being turned on, or a ball rolling across the floor. But by the end, all the kitchen cabinets are flying out, and people being dragged out into the basement, and chandeliers are falling from the ceiling. And like, I like something that builds up and slowly, continuously gives me the concept of fear because I th feel like that idea is so well developed. On like, I think the Blair Witch, for example, would have been way more interesting if you had like six people in the woods instead of three, because then you have three more people to haunt. <laughs> so stuff like that, I guess, would be like if. Like just initial reaction. That's the first one that comes to mind. What about you? Do you have any like scary movies that you're just like, what a piece of crap? <laughs> I did think Cabin in the Woods sucked for the first thirty minutes. Okay. <laughs> it took, for the first I, twenty minutes, I was a little, I was a little slow to pick up on what it really was. 
Yeah. Um, I was kind of biased. Like the opening scene, I'm like, I remember specifically thinking, for those who haven't seen it, the show starts out as a very vanilla, by the book, formulaic. Traditional horror movie. Yeah. Like so vanilla. It should be obvious and satire, but it wasn't obvious to me. Immediately. It kind of plays off of Cabin Fever, if you've ever, ever seen Cabin Fever, which is like a famous Eli Roth film. Yeah, these kids go off basically to a cabin in the woods, surprise, surprise, and they start experiencing haunting. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's this, whatever. It, it's not big of a spoiler, but there's a scene, there's a man or a young kid who tries to jump this canyon to escape. With the motorcycle. With the motorcycle. <laughs> And like the whole the whole movie It's Thor. It's Thor trying Oh yeah, it's Thor. It's Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> yes, I fucking forgot. So imagine Chris Hemsworth, like you have this most vanilla B rated, like CW production almost like okay, these the young, fresh teenage kids are gonna go to a cabin. This is so formulaic, we should turn it off. This movie sucks. And then they start having hauntings. But there's these weird clips where they talk to like these two guys at a console cracking jokes and the whole no- thing's tied to like an end of the world scenario where like human beings have to sacrifice other human beings in order to like basically maintain the peace from titans showing back up on the planet to destroy everything yeah and you don't know that and so you just it'll cut these scenes of like two guys talking at a control console like at a day job and they're just cracking. normal day at work yes water cooler saying weird shit. and yeah it doesn't and nothing really makes sense and they get haunted and Chris Hemsworth is like, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to be the, the strapping young lad that's going to save everybody. And uh, I knew he was going to die. The road's blocked. I can't swim out of here, but like maybe I can jump this massive canyon with my bike. I could jump this massive canyon with my bike. Exactly. And yeah. I, I remember specifically thinking he's going to die because the, this guy always dies. And this is obviously a by the books formula horror movie that my brother told me to watch for whatever reason. And he jumps this canyon and you think he's going to make it. Maybe something else will kill him. But no. And there's no like sci-fi like hints prior to this. No, this is the first time you really feel yeah, it. And yeah. he just blood splatters into an invisible like force field that looks Closest like the thing you <laughs> compare it to is like when they're shooting rockets at the machine in Independence Day. Yes. The mothership yes. and it hits the blue wall to protect it. It's like a force field. It's like he just yeah. hits this force field and it obliterates into blood and guts out of nowhere. And I just started dying laughing. Furthermore, just and the part that I think is really interesting, his character's bike that you watch falls down, hitting against this force field into like, the only thing I could say is he fell down to the center of the earth. I mean, it is the deepest canyon ever. And it just fucking flips you up side down on your scene. You're like, what movie am I watching? Yes. Man? And then from that point, <laughs> I was intrigued. And then what, this, what sealed the deal is so... As he said, um, we're already spoiling it. Basically, there's this giant conspiracy amongst nations. Every year, there's a ritual where basically they have to satisfy a ritual and kill certain people in a certain state to like put blood in this thing to appease titans from coming out of the earth and killing everybody. Like that's it. It's it's wild. And these kids are like stuck in this. And the guys at the table or at the consoles, their day job is to sacrifice people once a year and make sure it goes down the correct way to appease this ritual. They have like all these mythical beings trapped, like leprechauns and shit trapped in this facility. Sweet tooth looking guy from Twisted Metal. I mean, it's fucking insane the amount of horror things they keep in this fucking facility. <laughs> What made it become probably my number one horror movie is there's a moment where a character, she's trying to escape this whole thing, or he, I can't remember which one it was, but they release all these monsters from prison. Like all these mythical monsters that have been- They push the big red button. They push the big red button. (laughs) Everything starts uh, running loose. Yes. No more cages, no more jail. And a unicorn comes out of a cage and (laughs) spears a dude through the chest into the wall, like a rainbow unicorn- and just covers itself in this dude's blood and guts. And I was like, this is the greatest movie of all time. Ever. This is the best Ever. movie. Yeah. So that movie was probably my most like opposite of disappointment. Um, just like, it's going to be a piece of shit. And then you're like, no, this is one of the greatest horror movies ever made. Yeah. Uh, horror disappointments. Man, I was trying to think of one. I'm not a huge horror. I rewatched... I watched the remake of Pet Cemetery recently, and I remember the original made me scared as a kid. I didn't think the remake was that good. It was okay. okay. Damn, a letdown. Honestly, Archive 81, to bring it full circle. The ending of Archive yeah, 81 that bad. Is, is bad, dude. And my, I got my wife to watch it. And oh, she, no, yeah. I have my answer. My bad, sorry. Okay, what is sorry, it? Sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. Please, please finish your story, because now I know what my answer is. I got my wife to watch Archive 80, 81. She came to the same conclusion. She's like, it's, it was cool, and then it just dropped the ball. So just prepare yourself, but it's worth watching. 
it is worth no, no, watching. I appreciate that. At least it won't be as much of a blowback now when it happens. Um, Valerium, worst fucking movie I've ever seen in my fucking Valerium. life. Valerium. Valerium. What is that? I've never even heard it's of it. It's so bad. So, so, so bad. And it could have been such a good film. It's uh, Jesse Eisenberg and this female actor. I can't think of what her name is, but she's oh, great. Oh, The City of a Thousand Planets? No, 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 no. Um, not that one. Fuck. That's uh, like the sci-fi movie. Let me get the exact name for it for you so I don't mess this up. Jesse Eisenberg movies. Valerium. Uh, Oh, Vivarium. 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 Yeah. Yes. Have you like seen what this is about? Oh, I've all? seen the, uh, I saw the trailer and I remember thinking it looked cool. It looked amazing. So I'm not even going to talk about like what the movie was about, but it's just, it's so disturbing and uncomfortable and like just poorly presented that like by the time the movie was over, I actually like went on, uh, Twitter and tried to find this the director Lorcan Finnegan and just tear him apart online. It's the first time I've ever done that with social media because I was like, I can't get that two hours out of my life. And the images I saw in that film disturbed me so much that like it took me like two or three days to even forget that it existed. But it was just, you know, that feeling when you're like, I can't get that point of my life back ever again. And I literally just wasted two hours of my existence of humanity. And one day I'll be an old man and I'll think about that moment and regret the hell out of it. <laughs> that movie gave me that feeling. In Damn. Space. The trailer looks hardcore. I mean, it was great, dude. Like the, the whole buildup in the first part of the movie was great. And then it just became this really disturbing look at humanity and I was just like, this isn't even entertaining or informative. Like these are all so things that feel like, like it was just like dark with no like purpose. So it was, there's no, I feel like you could have shit on money and flushed it down the toilet and it would have been a better use of it than it was for the production of that film. Yeah. Like when you consider like world hunger, <laughs> all the different things that that money could have been used for. And that's what they did with it. So yeah. Like I hope that cause like I, I I'm tried to watch say, it now. <laughs> I, I tried to say Blair Witch is like my answer, but like it was more like that's one that grew on me. Vivarium's a movie that like I would rather get kicked in the nuts and like go through the hours of pain from that now than have to sit down and watch that movie again. I'm gonna watch it <laughs> just to see if I hate it is because that's like I mean you went on a rant. You did not like that movie. Yeah, well I hated it so much I fucking put it out of my head until we were sitting here talking about it and I was like, oh wait, there is a terrible movie I can talk about. <laughs> Damn, dude. It do, it looks so epic, though. It's disgusting. Like, so I'm trying to get a sense of... I've seen some movies where I feel sort of the disturbing or the horror was... It was more like we talked about like a movie that endi the ending let me down. And that's a movie where I got into it and was like, this is fucking great. And the ending was just terrible. Like, ter if terrible could like be redefined by another word, that would be the word for it. Damn. <laughs> what that movie? <laughs> what is your favorite all-time horror movie? Uh, it's, there's a bunch of different ones like for found footage I really love the Grave Encounter series which is, explores like a ghost hunting team getting haunted on like a ghost hunt thing it's like kind of a rip on uh, MTV scare tactics and all those old like ghost watching ghost hunt <laughs> TV shows where it's like oh did you see it uh, okay. <laughs> did you see that curtain move <laughs> like there's definitely something haunting here so the movie's based around a team that goes to a site that's filming a TV show like that, but the site's actually haunted. And it kind of shows like what would happen in that scenario if like they really got haunted and people started getting fucked up from like the spirits so and stuff. So it's like a on... mockumentary almost? Mockumentary, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Grave Encounters is great. The Tunnel is a really good Australian take on that. It's like really hard to find online to watch, but I can send you a link uh, if you want to know the exact movie that's about. 2011 it's about... looks like. Yeah, the cover should just be like a face of a gr like some girl She's screaming. Yeah, a girl yeah, screaming. that's it. Yeah. Uh, that's really cool uh, in the found footage realm. Blair Witch ties in with that, and then outside of that, I really loved the stuff Mike Flanagan's done. <laughs> like, uh, let me bring it. So he did Oculus. Uh, keep talking about that. I've never heard about it. Oculus is incredible. Like, if you're, if I was gonna say like any scary movie you should watch, it's Oculus. It's got uh, Rory Cochran, who's like one of my favorite actors from over the years. He's just been a part of some of my favorite movies like Dazed and Confused and uh, Scanner Darkly. Ooh, I like that movie. Yeah. Flanagan, though, did that. He made uh, Hush. Uh, he did the Haunting of Hill House series. Yeah. So right now, I would say 
it's a combination of my favorite films are coming from Mike Flanagan and then anything that uh, James Wan is a part of who did like the Conjuring series and Insidious and Annabelle, The Nun. Yeah. And we talked about Insidious last time, but it freaked me out because I had a astral traveling experience where I was like, yeah, I don't, hmm, <laughs> it's too real. And that movie was just like, yeah. Gnarly. Yeah, it was too gnarly for me. I mean, I watched it, but I remember it just, it bothered me for weeks. Like it took a, like, like you said with Vivarium, like it took yeah. me a while to just get that kind of out of my system. Dude, it literally ruined my fucking day. It was the first time in like years that I could even remember like something ruining my fucking day. And that ruined my day. I was more disappointed by watching that film than watching like uh touring end <laughs> during like the <laughs> pandemic stuff. And touring was like my life. <laughs> uh, what's uh, do you have any horror games? That you've, uh, uh, we don't know if we talked about horror games last time. We're just starting to get into that over here. So Resident Evil's to me is like king because it's like the first series that really brought like haunt jump scare for me uh, into like, oh, wow, like what an experience. Like you can blow shit up and be terrified at the same time. Um, most of my horror games are actually on PlayStation because we like to play those uh, together, my girlfriend and I. Oh, what's, dude, have what's you the played- name? Have you of played the, PT? Sorry to cut you off, but I have to say it. Have you played what's, PT? What's PT? It was the. It stands for Playable Teaser. It was Hideo Kojima's like marketing tactic to announce Silent Hill Origins, which ultimately got canceled. Uh, but what they well. did is he made a demo called PT under like a fake publisher in Dev House's name, put it on PlayStation Store, and everyone thought it was just like a demo for some new indie horror game. And eventually, I think it only took like a day or two because everything goes fast on the internet. But if you do enough things, you unlock a secret ending. And the secret ending was a trailer and announcement for Silent Hill Oranges. Silent oh, Hill. this looks awesome. Silent, Silent Hill. These screenshots. Whatever the new Silent I think it was called Silent Hills. It was, yep, it was. Yeah, yeah, literally says Silent Hills. Um, and it had Norman Reedus in it. And it was like one of the greatest marketing things in all of video game history that I've, it's it's one of the most genius moments and the only reason it didn't really stick i think culture is because the game got ultimately canceled and, a, and it was like hideo left konami and he ended up being a big train wreck unfortunately but that specific demo i have an old ps4 with it out of keep just because you can't get it anymore and it's worth i think someone remade it on pc no like, way and you can get it like as like an indie download off like itch.io or something but if there's any way you can play that. I'm talking, it's like a 45 minute to an hour experience. It's not very long. And I can tell you didn't know any, so you haven't been spoiled on it. Obviously, you know the, sec- the secret ending, but it has nothing to do with the actual game. It is worth, it's like, a, it is one of the best horror experiences I've ever had. It made me literally scream in a way that I was in, imba- we were playing with lots of people. And I screamed in a way I was embarrassed. Like I was embarrassed because I screamed as I was a little girl and everyone was there to witness it when I was playing and I still get, yeah, but that's when you're getting your money's worth. That's when you're getting your money's worth. But I mean, I still get clowned for that to this day. Like, yeah. You know, that's it, a good reason to get yeah. clowned on though. In my yeah. opinion, it was uh it's that good. I mean, it freaked me out. Um, and it's short. So I don't know. I remember seeing a headline, like there people were selling PS fours with it on eBay for like quite a bit of money because you can't download it anymore. That's so cool. But I'm pretty sure someone remade it. Um, PT. Well, to me too, based off of what I was looking at, it really feels like uh, the guys who made uh, Biohazard, the Resident Evil one with the uh, infection. Yeah. I mean, at some point, even we could do some type of cool, like uh, set it up where we'll stream, like us, me playing the game for one of the podcast episodes. And that would be fun. Yeah. In short, like I could experience it live with you. <laughs> that would, it would be fun for me to, to rewatch it. There's a, have you played Outlast? I was literally just going to say okay. that's, that's the game um, that we have kind of unanimously decided. It's like our favorite take on like found footage in video games. Cause it's not super long. I think we banged it out in like less than a day of playing it. The first one that is with like the insane asylum, but yes. Um, I love that the game was based around uh, hiding and running and not around like, oh, I got this weapon so I can fight this guy off. Like, it really felt like one of the best horror experiences I've ever had, movie or game, just because there was such limited uh, violence from me 
to defend myself. And I had to base it purely around just like studying everything and taking everything in and literally creeping up to the hallway to peek my head around the corner. And it's not terrifying as far as some games go. I think like I haven't played the evil within, but the evil within just looks absolutely gnarly. Um, but Outlast is just, in my opinion, one of the best horror games I've ever played. It's uh, I would disagree with you that it is not terrifying. I couldn't finish it. Oh, it was, really? It was too much. <laughs> I got to a point where I, it was like, I like being scared, but this is just more stress and anxiety that I don't need in my life. It's too much. I'm aging from this game. It was too, it was just too good at making me scared. And it was like the balance. It's, some, it's almost, it's not dissimilar to spicy food. You want a certain amount of heat, but not so much. It ruins the taste and everyone's got different preferences. And Outlast was, I'm just not ready for that. It was too much. See, I think part of what I was saying before about how I've chose to like really embrace fear as I've gotten older, because like some shit like that would have just destroyed me as a kid if I played a game like that. Yeah. Um, I just think I was in the right mindset when I played it to where I'm just like, yeah, give me more. Like, you know, intravenously inject more of this like fear into my life because this is fucking insane. Like the yeah, decapitations, the mad scientists, the descent into the basement, making it back up. It was that's that game was awesome. But yeah, in some ways super terrifying, but I guess mindset is everything when you're playing that. I also had somebody sitting next to me when I played it. If I was playing that on my own, probably wouldn't have finished it. I would recommend Speaking of first person in horror and immersion, have you seen Philips Hue lights by chance? Do you know what those are? I'm familiar. Yeah. They, they, uh, they have a system where you can sync basically like a Wi Fi bridge to a com- program on your computer. And then that can, read, that can read your screen, like the pixel information on your screen. And you can, you have to tell it where your lights are in relation to the screen. But once you get it set up, it basically makes the whole room match what's going on in your an interactive experience get yes. out of here man and i'm surprised <laughs> we didn't talk about that because cyberpunk was the first game i played once i got this set up and specifically for first person games and i think for outlast it would have made it i would have maybe cut the hours i made it into that game by half if i was playing in this because the immersion something about in a first person game you you see maybe like your hands and the field of view is pretty similar to what you'd see in real life and so your peripheral vision when when the lights and your peripheral vision match what you see on the screen, it really feels as if you're in the room or the space that you're playing just a totally. little bit more. It just gives yeah. it another but that's all. That's all you need is a yes. little bit more of something to pull you in and take you on a journey. And I think Outlast on that, I should try it. I should try it again. because That'd be cool. Yeah, I should try Record it again. It. I, Record it. I would <laughs> love to see some content from that. That would be it. Maybe for, I do plan on doing like a whole month of horror only this I wanted to do it last year in October, October, but I didn't prep, and I can't do that much content on the fly. Um, I, I would start in September and bleed yes. it into October. Yeah. So by the time October hits, you're already feeding the internet with content from September. Yeah, that's probably what I'll do. Personally. Start like yeah. a month, a month and a half early. Start building the content bank for October. Um, yeah, I'll probably redo Outlast. That I, I didn't even make it that far. I think I made it four hours, three hours. It was too much. I mean, we beat it in eight, so you got over halfway through. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you play Outlast 2? I played the demo of it, and that's what made us get the first one. We have the second one waiting to play it on the other system, but we just rotate through things weird here. We'll like pick it up to play it, and then we won't, and then randomly it's going to be a snowstorm one day, and then we'll turn on the PlayStation like, oh yeah, time to play this game, because we have nothing to do for the yeah. next 12 hours. Um the demo for it was insane, though, because if I remember correctly, it drops you into like a cornfield type of thing. And it was very like backwoods. Yeah. Uh, being hunted down by like the best term I could use is like uh, hillbillies. <laughs> like, yeah, haunted, hills, the hills have hillbillies. Eyes type yeah, scenario. very hills have eyes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you have um, a Do you have a VR headset? I do. I do. I'm using the uh, Rift right now. Have you? I haven't done this yet because I have a Quest 2 and I've. I know that I can, I believe, use my Quest as a peripheral and still play games on my PC and have it work like a Rift. But uh, Resident Evil 7, my brother says, in VR is is worth it. I bet. Because it had us on the edge of our seat, and that was just us playing it from console to uh, TV. So I couldn't even imagine that game with like the headset on, with the jump scares and everything. 
They also have Resident Evil 4 that just came out with like a VR mod or official sort of VR version. I've heard is good. Um, I need to try some more VR stuff. Have you done Half-Life Alex? That's the one everybody talks about. It's, it's kind of become like the new standard of what yes. they want out of games. Yeah, I haven't played it personally yet, though. I've been on like a huge outdoor kick, just to clarify. Um, the pandemic did you a number on me. son of a bitch. I'm trying to be. Stay inside and look at a screen. God damn it. So I'm dedicating a lot of my time to like painting, woodworking. And then the reason I'm doing it, though, is because I'm so burned out on the screen that I'm not enjoying myself as much as I used to. So I like forcing myself to do other things. So when I go and sit back down at the computer, it feels more like a reward yeah, than it does just like my day to day. But I've also been working from home for 10 years now. At some point, like I got to do stuff like this or else the thing that I love most is just going to feel like monotonous, which yeah. I can't have that with gaming because <laughs> gaming is like my favorite thing to do. Oh man, I remember being surprised at how, how many similarities we had last time. And I, yeah. I continue to be surprised this time. I think I am right around 10 years as well. I'm at eight or nine. It's a, it's a hustle though. Like you have to really find ways to take care of yourself when you're not like going to an office every day. And that's why I got you know, into jujitsu. I mean, that's what, yeah, no, but that's a great example. That is a great example of putting something new into your life to get you away from like the day to day of just like, yeah, let's go see what Twitter's talking about now. Let's go read shit on Facebook. Let's watch another YouTube video. It's bad when you feel like you've watched all the recommendation recommended videos. on <laughs> channel. That's when, you know, you've been sitting at the computer for too long. Yeah. I've had a few, I've had a few binges like that where you start getting repeat recommendations of what I've hit the bottom. I hit the bottom of the barrel on this. Subject. <laughs> what do I do now? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a pretty deep session right there. Um, wow, I was going to ask I'd, you something. Just barely. I had a question for you. Oh yeah, hit me. So aside from uh, Half Life, Alex, because I've talked about it with plenty of other people, but I've, I still need to play it, so I don't want to dive in on that right now. Um, but do you have anything in the VR realm that Ooh. just like blew you away to where you were like, "This is why I bought the headset"? So I have the Quest too. So it's the uh, selection is limited. Like it's all okay. It's all. Uh, it's an all-in-one system. They do have Resident Evil 4, which I played a little bit, but I don't. I haven't played enough, I think, to give a solid answer. There was one random experience. I mean, it's very shallow. I don't think it's very strong, but it was one of my first interactive VR experiences was called First Contact. And I don't know if it's... I'm, sure, I'm sure if it's on the store for Quest, it's on the Rift. I would be surprised if it's not the case. I have two. So there's this one, First Contact. It's like the short little experience where you meet a little AI robot that looks like Wall E and it turn it like it wakes and you have Oh to- dude, this is the same one I played. This is incredible. Yeah. It's yeah, it's no, awesome. It's, it absolutely like I felt like this was even better than the Rick and Morty experience for what they were trying to sell the Rick and Morty VR experience to be. Yeah, I haven't played Rick and Morty. I just know that, that first contact one I was no, it surprised. was cool, but it yeah. wasn't as good as the first contact one, even though it was only a short little like interaction thing, like the equivalent like of an old like Windows 95 game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, first contact was really good. And then there's um this is PSVR only, but Astros Ast- not Playroom, that's the demo on PS Astros. You can I think play it in non VR now. I think it's been ported, but it's Astro something. This little white robot, it's Sony's Semi new mascot, Astro VR game. What is it? I've definitely seen this. Yeah, Astrobot Rescue Mission. It's on PS4. That VR, it, it's a platformer, so you're not in first person, but you have to use moving around and exploring, like quote, exploring the environment by moving your head. And they, oh, in, that's they, cool. they integrate that in sort of the puzzles in the platforming. And it's, no, uh, this looks awesome because awesome. like it's the awesome. guy. Oh wow! I just watched this dude like hit something on a crane, and then like it brought the wall up, and then the wall became like the new area that he had to climb on in two D or whatever. I guess it's three D, but yeah, this looks awesome. It's really good. Also short, but really good. The one I would say um, that really stuck out to me it was from Epic. Uh, <clears throat> I think I know what it's going to be. Is it time? It's it's basically iRobot in uh, oh, okay VR. Um, oh, I, don't know. I think I know what you're talking about. Do you shoot the robots? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. What is that called? Epic Robot VR. I know. Everyone says it's awesome. Robo Recall. 
Yes. Robo recall. Thank you. Yes. Robo recall, in my opinion, is like where we're headed in regards to VRs and shooters. And that was the game for me that I was just like, okay, if you have Fortnite money and you put a good development team together, <laughs> you like VR can absolutely kick ass and run on our current builds. But the money in development is just not there with most of the other companies. So we're going to have to wait. But yeah. then- that was my kind of like crystal ball into the future of how good virtual reality games are going to be. <laughs> A lot of people talk about, I think it's another epic game, what's it called, where that you basically play the same game that they played in Ender's Game, the book and the movie, the ant, the, when there's no gravity and they play, there's like two goals and there's like rocks and asteroids and you float around and you can freeze each other. You try to throw. I'm not familiar There's a that. game, no. uh, what's it called? I think, you, I think it's Echo Arena. That's what it is. Okay, I've seen that in the store for sure. It's they. I I am one hundred percent convinced they just. It's not just. It's a phenomenal idea and it's hard to make. But they ripped the idea of the game that's played in the book Ender's Game, made it a VR experience, which is a genius idea. Well, uh, one of the best VR experiences we played was from one of those like mini store games. That's like a uh, five games in one bundle, right? Okay. All in the same thing, and all their games are based around like the Tron stuff that you see in uh, Tron Legacy. <laughs> With like the spikes oh. that you throw from one side to the other, platform versus platform, breaking through the floor to knock the player out. Like I think I've seen and that. It's great. It's one of the best VR games I've ever played, yeah. but it's absolutely derivative of the Tron. Yeah. Obviously, <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah, I think I love derivative stuff when I love the branch that the derivative comes from. If it's done right, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. I mean I the amount of Elden Ring fan fiction I've already written in my head it would be I would love if someone would make something that closely derivative to Elden Ring. Obviously, nobody will. I uh, I had a question, another question for you, if you don't mind me. Hit me. Spit back and forth with you. Last time we talked, um, our main focus of what we talked about was the Last of Us series. Oh, yes. In regards to any game that we like went back and forth on. Have you got any updates on what's going on with the TV series with HBO? No. Other than Pedro Pas- Pascal was cast. And, yeah, that's it. That's all I know. Yeah, so. and then the girl was cast too. Ah, uh, who I don't. I remember thinking the girl looked closer than I like Pedro. And he's great as the Mandalorian. Yes, I just in my head, in my head, Josh Brolin should have been cast. So I, that's yeah, the best. for Joel, definitely. I think he'd be a better Joel. Yeah, but that's that's a pretty solid Bella. Choice. Yes, so I like Bella Ramsey. She's the badass girl in Game of Thrones, like the young queen girl in the north. Yeah, 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 he gets uh, crushed yeah. by the uh, yeah, yeah. mutated giant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and she pokes it in the eye as her last breath. It's fucking badass. Yeah, yeah. No, she's one of my favorite characters so, from the whole series. And Pedro's awesome. And look, look, I could be wrong. I uh, I haven't seen the Batman yet, or the Battison Batman. Apparently, Robert Patterson's pretty damn good as Batman. Most My wife hated it. Everyone else told me it was awesome. Like, there's been a few people I thought were going to be bad, and they ended up being good. So I could be wrong. I thought Ben Affleck was gonna suck as batman i didn't mind him so yeah i at this point it's just batman's been redone so many times that i kind of have to just take it for what it is where yeah for me christopher nolan was like the last batman that i like wasn't expecting to enjoy like his universe with uh bale and ledger and hardy so now i just have to watch it like i can't trust anybody's opinion because there's just too many fucking batman films you got george clooney val kilmer michael kane not michael kane what's the guy thank you michael keaton as batman i know i'm forgetting some of the other guys too but adam west was like the old thank you yeah adam west (laughs) there's been a lot of batmans for sure spider-man's getting there too Spider-Man, I, that's the thing. Like Tom Holland's probably like the last Spider-Man that I'll genuinely enjoy. And then from there on out, it's like, okay, let's see if we can commit to another Spider-Man. Okay, yeah. let's see if we can commit to believing this is another Batman. <laughs> to your point, I haven't seen the Batman. I'm just not. No, ex- I'm just either. not excited. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll see it whenever. I watch. So are you gonna go see it in theaters? Well, um, no, I'm, I'll see it when it's conveniently like on HBO one night, and I feel like it. I'll watch that's- it. That's kind of the vibe here. The last movie I went to theaters and was like, I'm glad I saw that in theaters was uh, Mad Max Fury Road. Ooh, that was a good one. Damn, that was a good one. That had me on like the edge of my seat being like, what you the did, fuck did, did you I see just Dune see? in theaters? No. <gasps> I haven't seen Dune yet, though. How dare you? How dare you? 
dude, dude. I mean, did you did you read the books or the book, the first one? No, no, no. I didn't even know like that was like going to be a thing until my buddy, who's obsessed with it, was staying with us, and he was he couldn't stop talking about it. Um, my girlfriend saw the movie and said it was phenomenal. It's just one of those things where, like, if everybody tells me to go and see it, like, I probably am not going to watch it. And then <laughs> eventually at some point when, like, I have a free day, I'm going to put it on and be blown away and then go online and talk about how good Dune is. And everybody's like, OK, Boomer, like, way to catch up with us. But, like, yeah, that's just I, uh, how I am with things like that. <laughs> that was one in particular that I was, like, day one. It was not theater. I actually watched it at home because they launched that at um, home. But I had this awesome setup, with, like I said, with the lights. Oh, for real? Room and I have these nice yeah. speakers. So me and my wife booted, booted it up day one on HBO Max. And um, you weren't disappointed. I was not disappointed, but I also did read the books. And the reason why I asked, uh, did your girlfriend, she liked it. Did she read the book or did she see it version? No, that was her introduction to the series. And she still liked it. Oh, she thought it was phenomenal. Interesting. Most of the people that have told me they didn't like it felt... I hadn't read the books and my my I, theory was there's a lot of world and lore building that is technically in the movie but you won't really know what it is unless you read the books it's very hard to put all of those things together from what the movie tells you even contextually you have to be really paying attention and be really sharp but visually it's 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 stunning, it's stunning. right it's the best cinematography okay. ever so that's that's I would wonder to argue with that how many people would say that about Dune who are the same people who went and saw Prometheus at IMAX and thought that was a piece of shit. <laughs> people who didn't like Prometheus? The, the entire I went with a group of like 15 people to see Prometheus. I was the only one who walked out of the theater who enjoyed it. That movie's awesome. It's amazing, dude. But like they went in there thinking they were going to see like Sigourney Weaver oh, and Bill true, Paxton true. and all these dudes like roll through and start blowing aliens up in like an IMAX experience. And it's like, no, dude, like we're looking at like the coolest like interpretation of space travel until the expanse came out <laughs> like through cinema. But dude, I started watching the expanse because of you. That just reminds me. Yeah. How do you like it? I made it. I have a hard time with TV shows. I think I made it through the first season. I, it's been a while. I'm pretty sure I finished the first season. Okay, but like, how did how did you feel about it overall? With like feeling like you were being immersed into a sci-fi universe. It started working on me, but I don't love the detective guy, whatever his name is. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So like, I, I, it's very shallow. I don't like top hats. I think they're fucking just stupid. And he wears this <laughs> top hat. It's so shallow. So that no, no, I nuts. know he he was the one who frustrated me the most, but he actually becomes a very important part of the story. Um, I like so how I've, kind of badass he's becoming by the end of the series. Like he looked like a wannabe badass when it, the season started, but by the end of the season, I started believing he was a badass. So, no, he is he is he is a yeah. badass. But I mean, like the the way they shoot the ships, though, like from the outside and then panning in, yes, and like you traveling through the ship with the camera and you're yes. feeling the scale of these ships. Yes. You got to admit that's pretty impressive cinematography. The, the, the idea of gravity, like being a weapon, and people like having weakened bones and all the effects, and they call them belters. Yeah, like that was a novel idea that. I had not encountered in any other sci-fi. Or thought about or considered like, yes. oh shit, if I was in space that long, my like entire genetic makeup would change. Yes. Um, there was a guy on Rogan, uh, an astronaut, one of the guys that was on the space station. And I believe at the time he was on Rogan, he had spent the most time in space. I I'm pretty sure that's probably been broken by now. This was an old episode. But at the time, he had spent the most time in consecutive days in space. And he was claiming that your body would eventually literally eat all your bones. And use it for other things because it makes a decision like you're not putting pressure on me. I'm not having to use the structure. It's worthless. And I'm maintaining it with calories and life support. And really, I need other things because my environment has changed and that they would have to use these special machines that use like like bands because there's no gravity to put loads on their body and weight lift. And, so crazy. And they would still come back with like muscle mass loss and bone density loss and he was saying, I think eventually you would, you probably die before you could tr turn into like a literal balloon. I think your body would stop working, but in theory, they would eventually just all get eaten away. That's so gnarly. It's crazy. It's crazy. So that concept, when I was watching uh, The Expanse, was really good. And I remember that's the one where you have like one thread is the young kid who they like escape, like the Mars ship, whatever. And then the other thread is the detective on the asteroid belt. It's the same show, right? 
I'm having yeah, but okay. the, the general tone is like all these uh, groups kind of start off separately, and then eventually their stories all entwine in different ways. And now, if you watch into the series further, they start diving into like these groups then ending up on planets that are terraforming and experiencing like, Oh, what happens when like a new group arrives on a planet, but there's like a bacteria on that planet that has never been experienced by humankind. So like the ground itself and everything seems cool that you could farm on it. But in theory, there's actually like a dormant virus there that you could have never scanned for. Cause you didn't even know it molecularly like existed. And you're watching this group like scientifically figure out how to not go blind in the next 40 hours. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. It's, it does seem grounded in the sense of the problems they're solving in the show are not saving the universe from Sith Empire, evil Druid space. Ninjas. For sure. But that's yeah. the other thing that's so cool about the difference is like they're building the universe that eventually will lead to a point where everybody's so dialed in with space that the Sith can do their thing. Because yes. like the Sith aren't worried about bacteria because everybody's explored pretty much everything you can yes. in Star Wars. <laughs> You got to build up to that. Yeah. Yeah. The expanse is absolutely like day one training of like, Hey, these are things you should consider before going to space. <laughs> yeah. I, I need to watch it. <laughs> I, uh, I tried to, I tried to get my wife into it. The, the probability of me finishing a show is if my wife also likes it. Skyrockets. It's, like, it's six seasons though. It's a commitment. Oof. If she liked it, she's been trying to get me to do Ozarks, a bunch of shit. She's like TV. She's like TV when I did video games. Um, I'm planning to try and do Ozark. So everyone's, um, everyone says it's awesome. Everybody. I mean, it, yeah. it's, if it's existed as long as it has and people still are talking about it, there's got to be something good yep. about it. I wish uh, I got to get you to play Elden Ring, but you need to finish Witcher 3 for sure. You really got to get to the last DLC, which is probably my favorite, Blood and Wine. There is. You you are really close to my second favorite part of the entire game, which is the Bloody Baron quest, which if you're 12 hours in, it's a pretty early game. Have you done the Bloody yeah. Baron yet? I don't think so. Okay, you would know. It's probably, it's widely, most Witcher 3 heads would say it's the best quest in the game, most, the best writing. Um, I just got to the point where I found the Griffin's Nest of the... Oh, okay. The guys basically like destroyed this griffin's nest, and then the whole town's like, "Boy, is the griffin trying to kill us, bro?" And it's like, "Well, like, what do you think like <laughs> your town's like so far away from this nest that yet you all came out here with pitchforks and like fucked up this griffin's home? Like, y'all are idiots!" Like, that's the number one theme I've learned from Witcher is like, Witcher's super dialed in. Everybody around him, actual idiots. Yes, <laughs> that's that's the dynamic that Geralt. Is, he's not. He's a good guy, and he's really good compared to like how gross his his character is awesome because he doesn't get sucked down with like how bad if, everybody if ever else there was is. a character to like turn evil and just like go full joker on everybody it's him it's but he doesn't he doesn't yeah yes. but he doesn't it's he doesn't. you're right that's absolutely one of his strengths is like how like resilient he is to the shitty uh way the world treats him or i should say the people in the world um and you guys rewatch season one you haven't watched season two of the, the netflix show no, I wanted to play the game a little bit more and then get into the show. The season two still yeah. ends prior to where the game starts. Really? Yes. Okay. They basically, so you know in the game, the, the titles in, in The Wild Hunt is like the main antagonist. And The Wild Hunt shows up for like a split second in a vision at the end of season two. It's just like kind of hinted at. And I don't know how closely they're going to follow the game than the books versus the show. So the chronology might not be, but from my understanding, it's, there's still like a ways to go. The game starts pretty late. Like Siri, Siri is an adult. You're trying to find her. You haven't seen her for a long time. She's been like, she's gone through her training. There's flashbacks of her training. And se season two does have things that Witcher 3 has flashbacks of though. So the question to you would be like, do you want to experience those moments first as flashbacks in the game? Or do you want to experience those moments as the show? I think the hardest thing for me is more uh, my girlfriend is like a full-time nurse now and 12 hour shifts. Sometimes yeah. they're uh, night shifts. Sometimes they're day shifts. And there's a lot of stuff that we watch separately, but the stuff we do watch together, it's like sacred. Yes. And we can't like watch it without <laughs> one another. So if I have to wait to watch season two, I'm going to play the game. And then once I can watch season two, I'm going to watch season two. Yeah. Do don't, don't break the sacred. I understand this. Some shows are sacred. Well, it's, it's the shared 
experience yes. you get with your partner where it's yes. not you're, that you're just watching something together, but like you're taking that story and it becomes a part of your relationship. It's like yes. one of my favorite things about being in a relationship is getting to like experience art together. It's like the coolest. Yeah, we watched Game of Thrones together. It was fun. Yeah. Super Amazing. Fun. Yeah. Amazing. And then you rewatch it three or four times and you start quoting things together. And like we ended up naming our cat after Arya. Because nice. <laughs> of how much our connection is to Thrones. So which did you like season two though? That's what I wanted to ask yes. though, about The Witcher. It was better. So I I basically loved season one, even though there was I felt serious weaknesses. I love The Witcher so much, and enough of it was right that it it was all fine by me. Um, what was confusing was the time jumps in season one. I don't; they were done a little weird, even with for me with the game knowledge and skimming through one and two boards and skimming through what the books were about and reading synopsises. I I dove into the world of The Witcher after I beat the game, sort of appeased that that taste. I was pretty familiar with the source material, and I was confused in season one most of the times. Well, I watched it through one time and barely understood what I was watching. Yes. Like I enjoyed it, but I was so confused with the jumps. She watched it three times and then the fourth time watched it with me. And then she was able to sit there and kind of explain the timeline I was yes. experiencing. And when I saw it from that, her perspective, I was like, oh, this is phenomenal. Yes. Like in regards to like all the ways Geralt's interacting with these people, but like stuff that you're seeing is currently happening versus stuff that happened 20 fucking years ago. <laughs> yes. They just didn't do a very good job of. Like if you're gonna do those time jump things, I I don't know what the art form is, but I'm, some movies seem to do it where you can follow and it makes sense. And that was a little weak. They did not do that for season two, and I think it's better for it. They just focused on telling good stories. Um, they do a lot of. They have two or three arcs that are what you would call side quests, but they're very good at still moving the overarching arc while Geralt is essentially side questing. And uh, so you get a little bit of what the open world game is like, like this through the show. Through yeah, the that's show. cool. Yeah, I would, if you would mind, I'd love to interject the why I think they lean so hard into the time jump. Okay, um, hit me. It's just a theory, but the whole idea of like the Witcher that I empathize for him is aside from how people treat him, he has to live through all of this. Like he's going to age at a much different rate than other people who experience reality from a much longer time I see frame. Where you're going. Yes. And so eventually all of his fights, all of his battles will all bleed together as one. Like they're all just stories from quests that happened, but it won't matter if it was a week ago, a month ago, it's all a part of this long, long sustained journey. And those time jumps to me kind of made me feel that in a way. To where it's like, in some ways, I don't realize what time it's happening, but at the same time, it's like, it doesn't matter because all that matters right now is that he's been hired to go into this castle and basically break this curse on this girl that turns her into like a crazy flesh eating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whatever, whatever. I mean, that shit was so crazy rewatching that uh, scene where yes. he's trying to capture that girl and keep her from uh, hiding from the sun. Um, and that's, that's just an idea, though. And a concept that maybe they were trying to lean towards is just respecting that his journey is so long that time is almost irrelevant for someone like Gerald. That's a really good point. And as you were talking about it, it's if I were the makers of season one, that would definitely be my defense because that's that is a part of Geralt's theme in The Witcher. 3. Yeah, it is. Right. Yeah. Because he, it's he's part of what a, makes him yes. so knowledgeable about medicine and like all yes. these different creatures and why he's an encyclopedia because he's encountered them all before because he's been alive for so long. He's been alive for fucking ever. <laughs> yes. Um, and it's like that's also goes back into what we were saying, which is so endearing about his character is that he would be justified in just wrecking a lot of people. And not only has he been treated like shit and he sees humans treat him like shit and then be way shittier themselves and he still generally takes the higher path it's been that way for hundreds and hundreds of years he's had yeah, lifetimes of that since the mutation since yeah. the mutation and uh it's one thing they do a little bit better in witcher t season two is uh they sort of give you more background on how the witchers work and why they're so badass and what they actually go through and what the calling process is like and how brutal it really is and they get more into that um yeah, I can't wait to it's, watch it's that. It's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. And you definitely, you see, I don't think, uh, my memory of season one is not super sharp, but I don't believe you see like multiple witchers fighting on screen in season one. 
in season two you do, which is pretty cool. You see them like working together and using skills of potions and signs and and like their their collective knowledge of certain beasts and having to to like you do this, you do that, I'll do this. This is how we're going to take it down. It's fucking awesome. Well, I said this, I think the last time that we talked about this, sorry, I just had a sandwich brought to me. So I'm like really excited about there to eat because I'm good. I'm good to keep chatting. If you're good to keep yeah, chatting. I can go for forever. Bit. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I figured if you have the fam out, we can kind of just dive in and then yeah. you can edit around to uh, have it be a, f- a full uh, podcast. Maybe we'll this split it really- into two. Maybe we can split yeah. into two. Yeah. No, totally. This has just felt great getting to do such a deep dive on subject matter on this one, where the last one was more of an introduction. And this has felt more of like, cool, let's really like tackle a concept and a subject for 40 minutes. Like it's been fun. That's my whole point. But um, what we were saying last time on the call is what really blew me away about the Witcher show was it was the first time I saw a video game to TV series that I felt was like properly presented in regards to like, yes, I'm watching a TV show, but occasionally when he's in a fight, he's using like his abilities to like knock people back with wind. But it's not overdone in terms of a cinematic effect. It looks like how it would look on my monitor when I'm playing the game. And like, if I compare that to like the Resident Evil series where it's like awesome movies in their own right, but I definitely don't feel like I'm experiencing the Resident Evil game when I'm watching the Resident Evil movies. I feel like they're two completely different visual experiences. I don't know. I'm just, I'm a huge fan of what they're doing with the show because I think it's not just a really cool show, but the fact that like the guy who's playing Geralt actually like played the game and was addicted to the game and is a total gamer and is like doing his best that he can do to basically pay respects to gaming at a time where gaming's being more like monetized and capitalized on than it ever has before. I mean, fucking Jerry Jones of the Dallas. Cowboys, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, now co-owns a gaming corporation with Tim the Tap Man. <laughs> that I did not know. What? Yeah. Uh, so what Complexity a- Gaming is owned by Jerry Jones, and they just brought Tim the Tap Man in. It's kind of like the face of Complexity. <laughs> Do they have any uh, games out? Is it the Dev Studio? No, I think it's like a competitor to like a hundred thieves and other like gaming. Uh, this almost looks like satire. Yeah. But like now, that's why you watch streams because we love uh, Tim the Tapman at our house. Like he's one of our favorite Twitch guys or now YouTube streamer guys. But he just did a whole stadium tour for all the AT and T stadiums where he went and did live streams from the announcers booth, and <laughs> they had his uh, stream up on the jumbotron. And if he won a Warzone game, they'd have the fireworks and everything go off in the stadium. I mean, it's unbelievable the amount of money that's being thrown at gaming from every sector, man. <laughs> Well, you're telling me, dude, I don't follow Twitch at all. Streaming. You're good. No, you're yeah. good. A guy streamed from the announcer booth, filled the stadium. At multiple stadiums. No, no, no. There his- were people there. They did it on like one of the off days where it was just the stadium was sitting there and there was nobody there. So they just brought him in to help like and the connect. St- and the stream for- was just... Like, in well, playing Warzone. Why would they put it on the Jumbotron if no one's watching? Just for the fact that like they can and they just can use the electricity and they just don't give a shit. So it's like a marketing thing. Like they It's make- like he's sitting in the announcer booth playing, facing us, and then when he does a 180, he can see himself on the Jumbotron in his replays. <laughs> That's even that's almost even worse than what I was thinking you were saying. Yeah, because you're picturing wow. like he's sitting there and he's watching himself play on the Jumbotron live on like the biggest monitor ever. And I no. thought there was people in attendance. Like that. No, no a- people in attendance. Yeah. It's probably like just like other associates and owners of the Dallas Cowboys, crew, staff, whatever. And he's just basically playing in like the owner's box or like the announcer's booth. And then they're also spending money on fireworks and shit when he like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like at this time that this is where we're at with gaming after like how many decades of just like nerd waste of time can't make a living with video games to have Henry Cavell like come through and say like I am a gamer like I'm happy yeah. I got this role as an actor but like I love gaming just as much and to try and like keep the purity of that on the like pretty much the biggest gaming show that's existed thus far until the last of us comes out yeah I think the last of us it means a lot to me good, but I do too but it just it means a lot to me the approach that he's taking with it when so many people are just trying to you know cash in yeah he uh, he won he definitely won me over I wasn't a huge fan of Superman but when he started I wasn't either. posting yeah. about building his own PCs, I was like, wait, Superman builds PCs? That's pretty cool. So badass. Yeah, and then, and then I, my buddy 
I have a good friend who's a stuntman, and he was telling me that no, Henry Cavill is like legit. He's a real gamer. Like this in the stunt community, the guys that have worked with him, like he was getting around that he's chill as shit, and he was awesome. Yeah, like really um, into it. And then yeah. you learn about these other guys that are tied to like really big network TV shows, or like are athletes who like use their money to turn their basements into Dungeons and Dragons rooms. Yeah, to like bring their friends over with like custom made tables and custom made board pieces, and it's. It's interesting because you have the one side of it where it's like the corporate world is trying so hard to just own gaming like it does everything else. But then you also see these people who are part of it, who are the faces of it, and you realize like they grew up with games just like we did. <laughs> and it's such a cool, common thing. It's like, it doesn't matter that they're a superstar athlete. They experienced the insanity of what Ellie and Joel went through just like we did. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's sacred. I mean, gaming is sacred to me. It's a, like, it's a, I mean, I have a pie spend most of my free time outside of maintaining like the income flow, working on the podcast, making clips, like working on gaming content. It's a, uh, I do respect him for that. And I do like that. He said he publicly, like he took a big risk. He had a, an interview where he publicly in, re, in a respectful manner, pushed back and criticized some of the people in season two, not for their work, but because they wanted to force Geralt into a very two dimensional character. And he said, my biggest regret is that I didn't push back harder. I was always fighting with production and directors to keep Geralt closer to the game in the books. And, and, uh, and like, he was just genuine. Like, that's what I'm trying to do. And he was kind of saying, this is before season two came out. I think he was almost prefacing it. If you feel like Geralt is a little watered down, it's because he is. And I tried to not make it. I did my best with what they allowed me to work with. And it just came across really genuine. He really loves the Witcher legitimately. And I think that's why people are gravitating to him in the community it's like we can you can sense it you can feel it like this guy's a real gamer he he likes the witcher just like you were saying he played last of us too just like me he played the witcher just like me and loved it just like me no but i, I bring it up too with like my point from before like i know i keep using nolan's uh dark knight and shit for a conversation but like if you look at other villains and then you look at ledger's joker like yeah it's been massively celebrated and you know everybody's praised it for this that and the third but it's like if i look at um jared leto's like i feel like i'm watching somebody act even if i am still enjoying it like i feel like that's acting just like watching harley quinn i'm like these are people acting these characters out if i look at uh ledger's role as the joker though i genuinely feel like this person has become this character like and it's all those little mannerisms like the tone of their eyes like how they're looking at things like smirks like all these things that it's like i'm not watching somebody play this character this person has become this character and they're filming it and I that's would, how i, I feel say, i would say that's evidence too that he ended up killing himself yeah absolutely yeah. and um i feel that a lot when i watch uh Cravel play the witcher just like his subtle tones of how he moves yes. get, lifting himself up he's so respective of like this man looks like he's in his 30s but actually he's in like his 70s 80s 90s <laughs> like in, yeah in the lore yeah. so he's not gonna move like he did when he was in his 30s like he heals but he's also got all the sores aches and pains yes. that a 90 year old man would have fighting dragons <laughs> <laughs> yeah God, the, the Witcher lore is so cool. I could go. It's on amazing. And on. It's so cool. It's I've thought about like oftentimes you talk about screenwriting. Oftentimes I've thought about maybe doing a book or something, or as an exercise, flipping like you like like a remix, but flipping something like The Witcher. Okay, I'm going to flip The Witcher, but make it sci-fi, but also have a similar like special group of people that went through some sort of brutal upbringing, but instead of alchemy and potions, it's some sort of new technology, like CRISPR. And they use CRISPR, and it's like this horrible mutation, and a bunch of kids die, but they end up becoming super soldiers. Just that concept is is so... I, I've, I've gone down the rabbit hole. I, I, ah, I wish you would... I wish you got a little bit... I want to talk about a bunch of shit. I'm trying to, like, how can I talk about The Witcher 3? but not ruin anything for you. No, you're good. Yeah. You're good. What I like is it's just opened up the conversation gates to know that like, as we continue to uh, converse, I'll be able to continue to share more of what I'm experiencing and that'll give you an opportunity to talk more about it.